Hello again, everybody, and welcome to a beautiful summer edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. I love to sing uh, about the moon and the June and the spring. Uh, I love to sing uh, about the outlaw shows and the way they blows and they suck and they stink like <laughs> covered rose. Oh, I love to, I love to sing. And joining me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he's that piccolo playing himself, the great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure yeah. to be here once again to sit through all these filthy words so early in the show. But I have to say, you know, this is a tough one. We're doing it in the morning. We're releasing it late tonight. Stayed up late watching AEW Live. Last night was the night, we'll talk more about it later, where I thought to myself, they've given up on Friday nights for now. Why shouldn't I? Friday nights, they don't want to stay up late. <laughs> they want to... <laughs> Go to sleep early after they masturbate. Uh, eh, well, you know, a lot of people say, well, Cornette, you must think that the AEW program is the big draw on your show because it's the last thing you talk about. It's the main event position. I know it's just because after I talk about that, I don't want to talk about anything else. I'm so pissed off and disgusted that I want to end the program. That's why we say there'd be no entertainment after that. Yeah, plus, when was the last time my main event went on last? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's not their fault, because I, they are listening. We'll get to that also. But in some of our helpful hints and suggestions, uh, they are listening to those, but uh, they they certainly did not book a main event in the last position on this past week's program. But we we said they shouldn't, since they're... Approaching the the we bitching hour of midnight, and they're losing people to sleep anyway. But that doesn't mean they should try to encourage it. I don't know. Anyway, I've had a great day so far, except for watching AEW. I got up early in the morning, and I looked outside because, as I mentioned, the birds are twinkling. It's spring and summer and green, and the wildlife is out there. And I went out on the deck, and I. I sat and talked to my bird, the bird's sitting in the nest there. I think those I can't see, but the eggs are underneath, I believe. But I, I talked to my bird and watched a few of the chipmunks run around, some of the squirrels. It's It's been a nice couple of days. I got my emails straightened out. You heard about this. I told you about this. Hotchkiss was over when we shot the cameos after we got those done. Hotchkiss sat down and it had another couple of hours, but he, I was stuck in a loop, Brian, on one of those email problems of the many that I, that I uh, delineated that I had. I was stuck in a loop where I was signed in to remember I said on one of these fucking 15 email things I've got, I can't get out of the one email and to, and to another email address. It just keeps sending me back to the same place. I was stuck in a loop, but he was popping up all these screens and, making changes and adding settings and asking me questions. My head was about to fucking explode, but finally... What kind of questions was he asking you? Well, like, do you ever use this and that? I said, no, I didn't even know that was a fucking option to do. No, I don't want all that shit on there. I want to reply. I want to delete. I want to <laughs> forward. I want to print. And that mark is unread thing is good, too. Because that way, if I've read it, but I want to make sure I pay attention to it, I can see that it's in bold where I can read it again. Do you star your emails, the important ones, the ones you have to go back to? Do you put no, a I, I had a flag thing, but now there there was a flag button, but now there's no flag button. He said, do you want to? I said, fuck it. There's too many buttons now. Just uh, don't worry about the flags. I'll deal with the fucking. I'll put a little check on the computer screen next to it with a sharpie. <laughs> In the same place that it appears, so next time I go back there, it's in the same place, and I can see the check with the Sharpie. But I did, man, now I'm functional at least. It's, it still looks like shit. I don't know why they have to change things just for the sake of confusing people. But I finally, I did, and I've actually printed out a number of emails. Some of them we might read to, uh, this week on the drive through because we've been a, a few weeks where I haven't had a lot of contact with everybody but i got back with people inquiring about their packages sent out a few things for the folks who their stuff had been lost gave encouragement to the people 
who the stuff has been sent, but it hasn't arrived yet. Got some business taken care of. So that was at least halfway refreshing. I got a couple things I want to read real quick, though. I, I, I got these. These can't wait for the drive through. Um, this is from Jake. And Jake says, Dear Jim, my friend Matt grew up watching Jim Crockett promotions in the 1980s. He hasn't watched any wrestling in more than 20 years. About six months ago, I got him started listening to your shows, and tonight he got his first taste of modern wrestling. So imagine this guy hadn't watched wrestling in 20 years. Big fan of Jim Crockett promotions. Turns on a TV now, right? Jake says, I've attached the screenshot of his reaction to his first time watching NXT. <laughs> And I, and this is the, the best one that he could have watched, right? The closest thing to what he might have recognized. This further proves your point that modern sports entertainment style wrestling is unwatchable for fans of actual pro wrestling. So he gave me these screenshots, right, of these texts. From Matt. Checking out some NXT, don't know who these guys are. It's a three-way match. This one guy dove out of the ring three times straight in a row and then dove in the ring once, all as fast as he could do it consecutively. And then Jake replies, Corny's not lying. And then Matt continues, this shit is ridiculous. Guy just super kicked this fucker. He fell into the ropes, didn't sell, came off the ropes, double clotheslined the other two, and all three went to the ground selling the fuck out of it. I can't anymore. That's enough. S-M-H. I guess that's his his initials, SMH. Shaking my head. Ah, well, that's what he was doing. So that is a reaction from a person who is an old Crockett Promotions fan who hasn't watched wrestling in 20 years and spent 15 seconds and couldn't do it to himself anymore. But in a more, uh, a more serious vein, in a more positive, hopefully in the end vein, uh, email number two from... Uh, A-L-W-Y-N, Alwyn, Alwyn, I hope I haven't botched that too badly, um, uh, he's from across the pond in Wales, and well, you, know, you know, in Wales, none of the, the signs read the way that they're spelled in English alphabet, so I don't know what his name could be, fucking Foster, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, dear Jim, I hope you're well. I'm a lapsed wrestling fan. I've only been listening to your podcast for about two months. My friend has been listening for years. My friend has a 13-year-old daughter who, when she was young, managed to sneak a peek at your podcast. He doesn't know for how long. I hope I didn't say bad things, but he doesn't know for how long, but my friend told me he found out when she walked through the house shouting, The Mothership! Whee! <laughs> that sonic boom, boom blocker thing where you when you were screaming at me tremendous uh his daughter loved to giggle at his cult of cornet gifts or cult of cornet gift certificate his cult of cornet membership certificate as you made it out to fuck knuckle i remember that actually my friend uses both indicators and has been wearing a mask since march 2020 when covid became a thing here in wales birthplace and home of the exotic adrian street However, not everyone else does. My friend's daughter is currently fighting for her life in hospital after contracting COVID from one of the adults at her school. She's in intensive care and has under her arm my friend's cult of cornet membership certificate. I just wanted to let you know that while you were a heel back in the day, though we never saw it here in Wales, you will not be able to comprehend how much you mean to some people around the world. Keep doing what you're doing. My friend and his daughter are currently separated because of the hospital rules, and they can't even speak on the phone because of the tubes in her throat. But they both look forward to your show each, shows each week as both of them will be listening from different locations, and it brings some essence of togetherness between them. He never told me his friend's name. He never told me his friend's daughter's name. And I remember the certificate, but he had it made out to fuck knuckle. So what the hell? If he's a fan of mine, fuck knuckle. Bless you guys both. Um, we hope your daughter gets well and gets out of the hospital soon. That that it, it choked me up with the thinking of this little girl in the hospital with COVID with a tube in her throat and my cult of cornet certificate under her arm. So if, if, and if Alwyn or Foster or dipshit, whatever his name turns out to be, if he wants to email me back uh, with 
your actual names and mailing address, then I can send a care package over there of some stuff and, and your friend's daughter's own certificate that she can have as a get out of hospital present. But anyway, but I need more information. So Alwyn, if that is indeed your real name from Wales, uh, get back with me. As a matter of fact, I've got this email. I'll write him back now that I'm thinking about it. What the heck? Now that I can do those things with the emails again, I got my second vaccination shot. Hey, what? The mothership! Yeah! That was for fuck Knuckles daughter. Yeah. And for my goddamn ear, nose, and throat guy. <laughs> anyway, I got my second vaccination shot. Explain this to me, Brian. They're now saying all the mask mandates in public buildings and grocery stores, place where people buy food, restaurant, they're all dropping like flies, just like the COVID patients were last year. Everywhere, because now around half, they say, of the people, maybe a little more than half of the adults in the United States are vaccinated. I got news for you. I was looking at the news. In the state of Kentucky, it's more like 30%. In one county, two counties up from us, 19% of the people are vaccinated because it's out in the woods and they're a bunch of Trump suckers. So why are all the mask mandates ending now, especially when they phrase it? Well, it, you don't have to wear a mask if you're fully vaccinated. I just ran to Walgreens just in and out like three or four days ago, just to get one thing. And as I'm standing there about to, to pay, this woman comes in, you know, typical blonde soccer mom, Republican looking woman. And sounds she hot. looks at everybody. What now? She sounds hot. Republican. I said <laughs> okay. that disqualifies her from hotness. Anyway, uh, she looks at the, the cashier who's still, because it's a fucking drugstore, it's a pharmacy, there's sick people, the cashier's still wearing a mask. Oh, do we still need masks? And the, the cashier said, well, not if you're fully vaccinated. And the woman looks for it. You can see it on her face for a second. It's like, I wouldn't take that vaccine, but I can just act like I am. And then she just turns and walks off. So what they've done is invited all Republicans who didn't want to wear a mask to begin with because they don't believe in science, they don't care about other people, and they're fucking gullible fucking pricks that follow the drivel shoveled out to them like cow dung from a fucking con man who has since been disgraced and exiled. But the point is, if they do all that shit, lying is definitely not above them. So every Republican that's not wanted to wear a mask but has had to to go in a place and get service is now and they're act anti-vaccine, they're anti-science, and they're anti-mask, and they're anti-telling the truth. So you're going to have problems anyway, regardless of whether people are vaccinated or not. But explain this to me, Brian. If you get the vaccine, which, as I said, I view as an insurance policy, it's not like I'm going to immediately just because I've bought this million-dollar life insurance policy, go out and start tightrope walking across the Grand Canyon for fun. But if you're vaccinated, you can still get COVID, but you just don't get as sick or even sick at all, definitely not death or hospitalization so far, they say. Um, but you can still get it, and if you get it, you can still transmit it to people that aren't vaccinated. Bill Maher got vaccinated then got tested positive for COVID, had to miss two weeks on HBO because even though he was not sick, they wouldn't let him do the show and be around other people. So the question is, if you're fully vaccinated, why does that mean you do not have to wear a mask any longer because the mask keeps you from spreading your germs and disease to other people via blowing snot out your face? So if I'm vaccinated, if I get it, I won't get sick or die. But how does that keep me from spreading it that I shouldn't be wearing a mask? Isn't that a loophole? Is that, does yeah, that I mean, make sense? There's no easy answer here. Yeah. I mean, everything you just said is true. And I've seen it over here. The mask mandates are dropping one by one. And you go into these stores, you go into the supermarket, and you know that not everyone here has been vaccinated or fully vaccinated. 
But who's going to stop them? There's no check. How could there be a check? So everyone's just in there doing it. You get a card when you get vaccinated. I I got mine. Yeah. Yes. And that should be like a fucking name tag at a goddamn, either a fucking uh, JC's meeting or a swingers club. Hi, my name is so-so and I'm vaccinated. And that way you can come in. And if you don't have that, then fuck you. It's free. Go get it. It's, it's, it's just, and people wonder why I don't go out in public anymore. It's not just because there are pandemics going on. It's because there are stupid people out there that I don't want to fucking be in the presence of. And, and, and by the way, in case that isn't enough of an answer to the people who have emailed and a couple who actually know me have my phone number and have called and left a message, no, I'm not doing the same thing I told one of you four months ago. I'm not doing personal appearances or live events this year, definitely and possibly ever, because I have never enjoyed my life as much as I have the last year and a half. I have not been in a hotel. I've not been in a car on the interstate in a snowstorm or a driving rain thinking I'm going to be fucking killed. I've not been frustrated at gas stations where the pumps won't read the card. I've not been sick with a cold or a sore throat or even laryngitis or goddamn anything but my normal allergies, which unfortunately is something we all have to live with. I have gotten the most regular sleep of my entire adult life. My weight has never been so stable. I'm up early every morning and I'm asleep like a baby. I sleep like a baby every night, Brian. Wake up once an hour crying and piss the bed. But why do I want to fuck this up? And the the best thing is I don't have to go out in public and be aggravated by people. So I got vaccinated just in case when I make my post office runs, if some slobbering nincompoop doesn't put me on an intubator or a ventilator or a whatever aider, an alligator. But otherwise than that, I don't miss any of you. Not you, the cult, but you, the general public. And people again say, why does he want to live his life in fear in his house? I'm living my life in my house, but it ain't in fear. It's a relief. I wake up every morning. I don't have to go anywhere. I do not have to sit at a stoplight. I put 37 miles on my fucking vehicle last month. This is not living in fear. This is my fucking goal in life from the start. (sighs) Anyway. But. Speaking of which, goals, we're going to talk about goals. You know, we were talking last week on the drive-thru. We recorded it early, so we did not have the um, the exact total yet and the final tally from the WHS Crusade for Children. But I was talking to you about the Crusade because we were watching it on television. I was watching it. Did you watch it on the internet? I did not get a chance to, no. Oh, God. You didn't make that time out of your busy schedule. Is it on YouTube or the highlights, the best of? No, it it was being simulcast on their interweb site. But anyway, the crusade never has a goal for any particular year because they never, they never want the community to feel like they failed or, or to be disappointed. They're very smart. They always say everything helps. And this is an ongoing effort, right? So they never have a goal, but this year, because people who do mathematics on these type of things, This year, people started noticing, and then they went ahead and and put it out officially, that they were within reach of doing, for the 68 years they've been involved, $200 million. Because, uh, uh, you know, years generally, if they do $5 million, $6 million, it was down last year, they had to move the pandemic, blah, blah, blah. But they were within reach this year. So that was kind of an unspoken goal. So anyway, at the end of the whole deal, they wrap up, they give the total, they show the final tote board. What a fucking great finish that they did. This was a wrestling finish. The final tote board is like $5,063,000 something dollars. They needed $5.1 million to make that $200 million 
dollars raised over the lifetime of the telethon. They're like 30 something thousand dollars short. And everybody applauds the total, but you know that you can and the people at home, I'm sure we're thinking and you get and then they say, but and then they bring in the business that's offered to round up <laughs> to the fucking nearest hunter and they bring in thirty one thousand dollars and they ended up with five point one million even and two hundred million dollars over sixty eight years raised for the special needs kids in Kentucky and southern Indiana. And to show you how this thing has taken off, they didn't reach the $100 million mark until the 50th anniversary in 2003. 50 years to get to $100 million. They got to $150 million by the 60th anniversary in 2013, so $50 million, 10 years, and now they got to $200 million in eight more years. And we'd like to send a special shout-out to the best not the best, but the highest raising fire department this year was Pee Wee Valley, $260,000 from the Pee Wee Valley Fire Department. Pee Wee Valley, where's that? It's right up the road from me. It's right past Cre Crestwood. It's a real place, Pee Wee Valley? Are you fucking kidding? It sounds like it's made up, Pee Wee Valley? You've never heard of Pee Wee Valley? I've never heard of Pee Wee Valley. It's right up the road from Crestwood. <laughs> I don't know what Crestwood is. Crestwood. Is that the country club? God damn no. Is that no. where you used to go and play tennis, Crestwood? No, that's cross. That's across the, the, just a short bit from Anchorage. Anyway, Pee Wee Valley's where where uh, the Monroe brothers live. Well, they got a, I, a, a, a nice that? place out there, and and their neighbor boy, he came over. Eb Dawson, the neighbor boy, come over this week. He he's the one that has the trailer. They needed to haul some things. So they brought Eb. But they have to keep an eye on him. I told him I, I couldn't because I had things to do. But if if you leave him stand out in the yard by himself and you don't keep an eye on him, he'll wander off and then you won't be able to find him and he can't figure out how to get back. But he's got the trailer. Anyway, that's the update for the Crusade for Children. And in anticipation of what's going to go on tomorrow, I already sent the check for the Crusade, for the cameos that we did last week and... You've still got some time. If you got shut out, the Father's Day cameos, we're doing 50 more. Tomorrow or today, as you're hearing this for the first time, whatever time zone you're in, but Sunday, June 13th, Sunday, June 13th at noon Eastern, 50 more cameos at cameo.com slash Jim Cornette. And as we mentioned, we sent 10 bucks off uh, all of them last week, and I've already sent 10 bucks off with the ones we're going to sell tomorrow and sent the check. So that's $1,000 for the Crusade for Children. Thank you, guys. And try to jump on these because Hotchkiss has vacation coming up, and I've got some things going on, and we might not do uh, more cameos until next month. This is probably going to be the end of June. So hop on these if you can at noon Eastern on Sunday the 13th. Um, We got a big announcement on the drive through your show this week. You don't know about this. That's because I don't tell you everything that goes on about your show. But we've been talking about the, you made fun of me last week talking about the NFTs. Like, I don't know my computer technology, and I don't know that they stand for non-fuckable tokens, and I don't know, or non-fungible, fung fungible. What did I say? Never mind, don't say it again. We might still be able to make YouTube. Um. You made fun of me, Brian, for all of my various technological woes, but I, me, Jim Cornette, international man of mystery and, and Luddite, there's a good word for some of you out there, I'm going to be one of the first of my generation to have my own NFTs. What do you, what do you think about them apples? Wow. <laughs> I think that's great. Well, thank you for that full-throated endorsement. Um. No, we're going to have an announcement on the drive through this Tuesday about exactly what and exactly where and exactly when, but you ain't going to believe these things. And now we're, we're going to say, we're going to say they're trading cards because as you mentioned, when you were being old Brian know-it-all that they, these NFTs can be anything, they can be memes or they can be this and that and the other thing, but we're going for the trading card design because you know me, I love collectibles. I manufacture many of them. I collect many more. I'm a collectible nut. 
See, you can collect me. I'm a collectible nut. Um, and we're doing trading cards, and there's going to be four levels of these things. And the the number of the level depends on how many there are. It gets scarcer as we go to the top. And there'll be two levels that go on sale soon to the general public. I think everybody should hop on them because they're going to be inexpensive and not not still not that many of them. They're going to go quick. But the upper two levels, Brian, a signature series, the n level number two is going to be my signature. My autograph is embossed on these beautiful, highly sleek, designed tr electronic trading cards. The signature series is three different in the series photos of me with my signature embossed on them. And then the, the big one, the holy grail of Jim Cornette NFTs that will never, ever be duplicated, often imitated, baby, but never duplicated, is going to be a high-tech take on the Cornette face. It's it's going to look like one of those those real cool black credit cards that and and with all kinds of... Oh, it's going to be wonderful. I, I can't even di divulge one of the secret things that this thing is going to feature. But anyway, and not only that, but the, with the top two level cards, the Signature Series and the Cornet Face, those are up for bid, but you're also going to be able to bid on a full Jim Cornet ring-worn outfit with each one, jacket, pants, shirt and tie and with the cornet face jacket pants shirt tie and ring used racket with wrestler dna on it and these things are not easy to come by because i haven't sold any ring worn stay they're all they're all over it on a and e the ring worn stuff but i haven't sold any ring worn stuff in years and have not sold any rackets in years and am down to just a few that I was keeping for a rainy day, but and the stuff on the wall is not coming off yet. But the the rainy days, it doesn't look like it's going to rain anymore. I don't believe I'm going to need any more rackets. So anyway, we're going to have the information on the drive through this week about that, where folks can hop into this. I'm I'm making another highly sought after and prized collectible that is going to appreciate and value for years to come. For you and the collector. For me and the collector, everything always appreciates. I appreciate everybody and everybody appreciates. And speaking of appreciating people, happy birthday, Hot Rod, Rodney Esty. Hey. Hey, I'll tell you. Oh, his house caught on fire. This kid started screaming. His wife said, shh, you'll wake up daddy. <laughs> anyway, um, Hot Rod is, I don't know how old he is. I don't think he admits it anyway, but it's his birthday in this time period this weekend that we're we're doing this. I don't know when you people are listening to this. That's a different story. But uh, we want to wish Hot Rod a happy birthday. He's one of the, what do the kids say, one of the OGs of the cult of Cornette? The originals? That's what the kids say, yes. Well, see, I've been listening to too many kids. Um, Speaking of listening to too many kids, what is this I hear now about Leo Rush has now decided to retire from wrestling because of a separated shoulder. This is the guy, as you'll recall, that first got on our radar when somebody told us that he was one of those fucking morons in CZW that took a power slam off the roof of a garage, an actual, not no. a... Not a house, but a, a, a auto body garage through a flaming table and then popped up and didn't sell it. Or was he the one that came off a, a ladder? It was the table? ladder. I the think ladder. Was, I think it was the ladder and it was after it was already announced. I, I could be wrong, but I think it was after it was announced that he was going to NXT or going to <laughs> WWE. And it was like everyone knew he was on his way out, and that's when that footage emerged. Well, thank you. So to make sure that he had his proper send-off from his local promotion, he took a power slam off a ladder through a table and popped up and didn't sell it. Then went to NXT, and we said that he could be a million-dollar talent, but instead he wanted to be a wrestler. Remember, he, he had well, a no. slap. But what? that but that wasn't NXT. That was on Raw. You saw him on Raw and said he could be 
the greatest manager of this generation. Yeah. And then he went to NXT and he was wrestling there. Well, how did he get on Raw first before he went to NXT? I guess they brought him up and then they they sent him back. What the fuck? Boy, well, he's been being sent back for a while now, but the like a bad meal at a restaurant. He's sent back constantly. But the point is, here they had somebody. Of course, and I've mentioned before, I called him one time on Twitter when he did. Didn't he retire another time also? He decided I'm quitting the business, and that lasted three months. I think so. That may have been when he left WWE or NXT the last time. I, he was going to do something. Now. The point is, he's 28 years old. He's been back and forth like a ping pong ball. He's quit the business a couple of times. He lucked into, they completely asked backwards without even meaning to put him into a spot where he could have been a million dollar talent. This guy as a manager with the slappable face. And the fact that he's the size of a fucking nine-year-old child and that he has such an obnoxious demeanor and can talk his ass off and, bump. and can take all the bumps. Yeah. You could have got a ton of heat on this guy. People would have wanted to see him get the shit kicked out of him. If you didn't give it to him too often, it would stay that way. And he could have added to the program instead not only did he think that it was a good idea that he should actually be a wrestler, but they actually humored him in that and let him wrestle. And then it was an embarrassment because he's the fucking size of a nine-year-old child and guys were having to sell for him. And he was doing all the shit that a normal sized human being would do, which made it look bad because it just devalues all the moves. So it was, they turned a guy with unlimited upside and all those positive attributes, they took those same attributes and put him in a position where every single bit of it worked against him and made their show look like shit. And you can tell that he's mentally, he, now that I think about it, now that I've talked about the no selling the power slam off the ladder and the fact that he retires every time the wind changed direction and the fact that he, I believe I've called him one time for something else stupid he said i called him on twitter a mental case and then he said are you calling a representative of such and such mental health organization a mental case and i said well apparently i am so you're fucking nuts you're an idiot uh apparently mentally he wouldn't have been able to handle that top spot anyway but think about this this is a guy who no sold a power slam off the top of a ladder through a table, but he separates his shoulder and he decides, that's it, I'm going to retire. I won't be able to hold my children with this bad... Well, how would you be able to pay for your children? Because unless you've got some other sparkling talent that has not heretofore come to light, Leo Rush, you were going to make a lot more money in the wrestling business than you are any other way. It, I don't know, it can... Maybe they're going to hire you for a plumbing or electrical job, one of those little short people that has to go in the tight spaces under the sink. Or like, I had a four foot eleven electrician come over here one time to the castle. He was the smallest guy that worked for the company. They had to call him special to crawl through a portion of my attic to run a wire. Maybe that's what he'll do. But he, uh, if he already worked for and fucked up his run with the world's largest promotion. But he'd been working for MLW. They said he just signed to to go to New Japan. Do they now have a, a minis division like they do in Mexico? <laughs> no, no, no. First of all, he indeed is currently, I believe, under contract in New Japan. He's In his retirement note, he said that he's going to fulfill his contractual obligations to them. So do they have a minis division now? No, he's a, he's a light heavyweight. Look, if the light you heavyweight, ain't shitting. if the light heavyweights, that's, that's, that's like saying I have a tendency to overeat cheeseburger. No, but listen, if the light heavyweights of yesteryear are the heavyweights of today, it makes sense that he would fit into a light heavyweight division where guys are smaller than ever before. <laughs> and I will say in NXT, I love the stuff with him and what is it, Angel Garza? I thought they had a great little thing going on there, a great series of matches, great feud, and then. They brought Garza up, and Leo Rush was never on TV again. So, uh, just weird to it. The is, he, he signed to New Japan. Yes. AEW wanted him because he's, he's a small child who is psychologically fucked up about the way he thinks about wrestling. And 
is an indie darling, so of course they wanted him. So he he thinks that because he's 28 years old, he just separated his shoulder. New Japan already has him signed, and AEW wants him. He's going to somehow provide for that young child that he can't hold in his arm in a better fashion. Uh, this is the kind of people that get it. How many? What's that one girl that's retired 16 times? Every company that brings her in, she shows up once and then quits the business and puts it out on the internet and then shows up again and quits the business and puts it out on the internet. You got to, because when you open the doors and say everybody can play, then you get a lot of people that are just doing it to tickle their own taint and aren't in any way serious or potentially think they're serious, but can't emotionally, mentally, or physically handle what you've got to do to be in the wrestling business. Even today, when it's easier than ever, when the travel is easier than ever, and the fucking, it's easier than ever to get a job because they're hiring anybody. And even you've got a billionaire that's paying for every outlaw prick in the world just if they make the right friends. And they can't handle this? Imagine if every night those fucking fans were coming over the rail to fucking punch or knife that fucking heel. Imagine if the baby faces were being depended on to actually draw a fucking house. Imagine if they actually, well, the only thing I can say is it's much rougher today in terms of when you actually get in the ring because they're more reckless and they're more dangerous than ever before in all the stupid shit that these barely trained idiots pull out of their ass on the sperm of the moment. But otherwise, if they can't handle the business now, good fucking God. I mean, that's the sad thing. A lot of these people would never have tried to get into the business years ago. They're getting into the business that they've been they watching. They may have tried, but they would have not have succeeded. I don't know. I think a lot of these guys get into the business because they watch these guys that do the flips and stuff. And that's what they want to do. I mean, no one's going to a wrestling school and saying, you know, I really, I always wanted to be like Greg the Hammer Valentine. How do I do that? They want to learn how to do the moonsault. They well, want to learn how to do what? the flips. Where they, they made a mistake because if they were old enough to remember, Greg the Hammer Valentine was hanging with Flair and all those other guys in the Carolinas because right. all his shit looked good and he was younger then. You've seen WWE Most Wanted Treasures Beefcake and Valentine, Greg Valentine. Um, and also Greg Valentine. What do we, with the late 70s, our inflation calculator, we don't even need it. Um 40 years ago, 42, three years ago, Flair and Valentine as the top heel tag team were making about 150 grand a piece in the Carolinas per year. That would mount up to somewhere around six or 700 in today's money. And plus they only had to travel in three states to do it. So yeah, more people should be going to the wrestling school saying, I want to be more like Greg Valentine. Did you see Tony Khan put out a statement? No, he always does. I've I've lost track and I don't care because, you know, it all sounds the same. But what is his statement? See, I found this one really funny just considering Leo Rush did have or does have this reputation. He had just recently popped up again with MLW, I think, like you said. And then all of a sudden he was the surprise. Every year there's the annual surprise during the Casino Battle Royal. It would be a surprise if the Battle Royal didn't suck. But instead of that surprise, we get a surprise contestant in this contest. And this year it's Leo Rush. Oh, wow. Let's see what's going on. He's towards the end. You're thinking, oh, my God, are they going to have him win? And that's how they're going to give him a push. No, he's eliminated. He never comes back. So here's one Tony day in AEW. One day. The business. So, of course, one day there, Tony Khan has to put out a statement. <laughs> I swear, it, there was one guy, I can't remember, I don't know what his fucking name was, but when in Ring of Honor, Delirious was booking, and he knew this guy from the Independence somewhere, and he, he said, well, I'm going to book so-and-so, okay. And then we get there to the TV, and said, well, where's so-and-so? He, he decided he's quitting the business again. What? He unretired, got booked, and then quit the business before he fulfilled his booking. Fucking morons. <laughs> well, you know, but uh, <laughs> here's Tony Khan's statement. Okay, go ahead. Leo Rush reached out to me today, and he shared that he planned to announce his retirement from pro wrestling tonight. While this news was unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, his news was unexpected since the asshole just said he'd come back last week. I'm glad that he's made a choice that he's confident will make him and his family happy. Leo is a great talent, and I enjoyed briefly working with him. And I absolutely wish him the best. Leo is a great talent, and I enjoyed it when he briefly walked past me at the gorilla position on his way to my ring. All right, let's let's make a bet. You and I have been proven in the past that we're not very good at gambling. But let's make a bet. No wager or anything. How long does this retirement last? Outside of New Japan contractual commitments, any independent show, MLW, shows up in AEW again, wherever it may be, how long does this retirement last? Is it just as long as he's injured? Well, he's injured, so he can't fulfill the New Japan stuff. I'm going to say it's going to go of either one of two ways. When he's able to work again, he's either going to fulfill the New Japan stuff and already be working on independence before his last New Japan match is over with, or he's going to start fulfilling the New Japan stuff, and they're not going to want him to finish. One or the other. All right, we shall see what happens, but... You know what? You know what? Honestly, I think that Leo Rush, the whole problem with him and this, you know, on again, off again, hot and cold relationship that he's got with with the wrestling business is just it comes down to Brian. I don't think he's getting a good night's sleep. I really don't. I think if Leo Rush, instead of coming off those ladders through tables that are on fire and on concrete floors and banging himself up, if every night he fell into a Helix sleep mattress, I think that he would be rested, refreshed, relaxed, and ready to go. Because I am, I'll tell you what, folks, you will be too. Helix sleep has the mattress that is made for you, literally, because you go to helixsleep.com, and you take their quiz, it takes about two minutes, you just match up your body type and your sleep preferences, you sleep on your side, on your back, do you like soft, medium, or firm? They've got all kinds of ways to customize the various mattresses that they make to make you happy and give you a good night's sleep, and once you take that quiz and you order that mattress, and it's delivered, then the wonder of the unboxing occurs one person can drag this box or bring this box right into the bedroom, set it where it needs to go, and then poop and watch it inflate to life. You don't need 16 guys or the Monroe brothers bringing it in for you. And if you go to helixsleep.com slash JCE and take the two-minute sleep quiz, get matched to a mattress that also has a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up if you don't love it. If you go to helixsleep.com slash JCE and go through what I just mentioned, they're offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash JCE. So you got to do it now. You don't want to be tossing and turning. You don't want to be like Leo Rush, uncertain about your future in life. You want to be rested, refreshed, and ready to tackle the world, especially since the world is so fucking dangerous out there. So sleep good with a Helix Sleep mattress at helixsleep.com slash JCE. Well, Brian, an important member of the cult of Cornette is in the news. Have you heard about this, read about this? Stephen P. New has made the news. I have seen this. I have heard about this. I have, what, what else did you say? Read about this? Heard I about have this? read about this. I've seen this, and I've heard about this. Well, I'll tell more people about it. Um, in Beckley, West Virginia, the Beckley VA Medical Center, the Veterans Administration, the VA Medical Center is going to be paying out more than $10 million in settlement funds to the 62 patients who say that they were sexually abused by former doctor Jonathan Yates. New Taylor & Associates, which obviously is Stephen News. Ace Firm, uh, his wonderful partner, Amanda Taylor, uh, New Taylor & Associates confirmed the settlement on Friday, while Stephen News Firm represented 56 of the patients. An additional six were represented by other attorneys. News said his firm believed the value to be a lot more, but the amount was capped under the state's malpractice code. So basically, the state of West Virginia has put a limit 
on the amount of money that can be awarded under their malpractice code. And because of that, actually, Stephen P. New could have got these people a whole lot more money for the the pain and the suffering and the the uh, the bullshit that they went through. They go, they're veterans. They go to a veterans administration medical center. A doctor sexually abuses 62 of them. And yes, they got $10 million courtesy of Stephen P. News efforts and those of the people in concert with him, but they could have got a lot more because of the egregiousness of this. And the fact this was a, that they basically just slam dunk this case but the state law prevents it, which I think is bullshit. And uh, while the civil and criminal portions of the case are over, New said he would still like to see the results of the VA Office of the Inspector General's investigation. And he also believes congressional hearings by Senators Capito and Manchin are warranted. Well, good luck with that, Stephen. That fucking piece of shit, treasonous, turncoat, backstabbing Joe Manchin, Dino, Democrat in name only, consorting with the fucking enemy. He's the reason why everything good that was about to be done so far is being blocked because he's sympathetic to the Republicans and the fucking hillbilly suckers that he thinks are going to vote for him. But anyway, Stephen P. New did say we did what we set out to do. Jonathan Yates is in jail, hopefully for the rest of his life. He doesn't have a medical license. He will never have a medical license. And we got the veterans compensation for the horrible things that they went through. So at any rate, there, uh, there's other things involved in that. You can look up uh, WVVA.com. That's WVVA News there for more information on this. But Stephen P. New fighting for the rights of the little guy. And just the, and the winning. state. And, and, winning, and winning, as always. Just and the, and the state trying to fucking take up for... Doctors that doctors that misrepresent themselves. They better watch out because, you know, Senator Stephen P. New has a nice ring to it. Oh, boy. And, hey, he's younger than Joe Manchin. He's better looking than Joe Manchin. And he's a lot smarter, obviously, than Joe Manchin. I think Senator New. That sounds good. Anyway, so from that, we go to someone else making the news, but for all the wrong reasons. Did you hear about, I won't even say his name. I'll just say the guy that people on the internet call the human botch machine. Now you know who I'm talking about, don't you? I'm actually not exactly sure. That doesn't narrow it down as that much as I think you think the, it does. Old Jack Evans. Oh, is that old his name? Jack the, Evans, the human, the human ping pong ball, the fucking <laughs> 140 pounds of fishy white flesh with a do-rag wrapped on it. The human botch machine had the nerve to fire up at Lance Storm on Twitter last week. And I'll just, I'll read you what Lance Storm said, mentioning no one's name. He replied to one of uh, the, that's our Mongo uh, account tweets with uh, reminded me of my favorite wrestling statement. We used to pretend to beat each other up, would barely touch each other, and fans thought it was real, so we called them marks. Now we really beat the hell out of each other, and fans think it's fake. Who are the marks now? Well, this has been said many times, many ways, not even at Christmas, but by me and by many other people in the wrestling business who are shocked and amazed at what goes on these days. I heard that in the late 90s, I think, the first yeah. time. It was a Dutch mantelism also. So anyway, that was a statement that Lance Storm, a wrestling professional of 30 years, a guy that performed at a high level for major companies and has since been a well-regarded trainer, he made that statement on Twitter. <laughs> of all the people that might have a voice to step up and criticize Lance Storm, here comes the human botch machine. And apparently, Brian, I guess he's like a lot of these guys. He's he's off his medication because if he's off his medication, he, he's, he's, he's having some issues and he goes on a goddamn way to wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five, six. I don't, do they call it pages on Twitter? Six tweet thread rant a thread 
a thread, a six tweet thread at Lance Storm's statement. And somebody better call Jack and see if he can get back on whatever medicine he's on, unless it's meth, in which case that might explain this. But anyway, that might explain his physique also. Jack Evans says, hey, Lance, nothing about your favorite statement is true. While you yourself have the reputation of being the easiest to work with, your generation does not. In fact, except for the mid-2000s when strong style was all the rage, your generation is known for being the stiffest pricks around. How quickly we forget. Your generation had large numbers of people refusing to take power bombs because they were very sloppily getting dropped on the back of their heads. You're ge- Who's- Baron... Well, I know, bear in mind, this is a guy who's worked outlaw shows his entire career and has n- n- never been in the ring with major stars that gave a fuck about him. If, this is also a guy who's dropped him his own self on his head on a regular basis his entire career. Yeah, in the 90s, you had a bunch of muscle-bound nitwits fucking power bombing people because that's the start of the era where you didn't have to be trained and you could just get in and make shit up but that wasn't at the high level that wasn't in the wwe that wasn't certainly involving lance storm but to be very fair if we're talking about on a national basis where we saw that two guys you could say sid and vader early 90s wcw with all due respect yeah and i'm no lance storm defender that's not Lance Storm's. I don't consider like Lance Storm with the WCW guys before him is like his generation. <laughs> you know what Lance Storm's generation is? Jericho. And not just because they were a tag team, but guys the same age who were yeah. influenced by the same style, the same stuff. They all applied it in different ways. But were talented enough athletes to perform it safely and responsibly. But wait a minute. Mr. Evans goes on. Your generation is when Bret Hart had his career ended by a super kick. Yeah, but Goldberg. Fucking Goldberg. I, I, I just watched that. I literally yeah. just watched that clip. Yeah. Listen, to your generation is the ones that told all the youngins to tighten up their forearms, causing them to get rocked on a nightly basis. I don't even know where to begin here, besides the fact that you ought to know how to throw a fucking punch if you're a fucking man, and these little goddamn pussy-ass flipper forearms look like shit. Nobody ever got rocked by a fucking working forearm that looked like anything at all. Now, these the, the guys now, their forearms look like they barely touch each other. You can work a forearm, but anybody that ever got knocked out by a forearm probably deserved it. Uh, your and listen to this. Your generation hit us so hard in the head with chairs that they bent, and we weren't allowed to complain about it. God damn! Then you should have stayed away from fucking ECW if you were a job guy in ECW. Hold on, he said we like it's happened to him. Has this happened to him? Well, I've, yes, he, that's the point. He's worked for every fucking mud show independent. He's never been involved with a major company, even then for maybe for a cup of coffee. And I know some people will say, "Well, wasn't he in TNA?" Well, do the math. Um, but no, nobody's ever bending chairs over his head except on some outlaw mud show where it's somebody else of his same level. Why would Jack Evans even be hit over the head with a fucking chair in a major company? He would be nothing more than a job guy. He wouldn't be doing a fucking angle. Anyway, and we weren't allowed to complain about it. It was the sloppiness and then parentheses. And this is coming from the botch master himself. <laughs> From your generation and the stiffness from the strong style folk that caused wrestling to go through a change that has made pro wrestling massively safer today than ever before. This fucking lunatic thinks that wrestling today is safer than ever before. He continues, all my big bumps I've walked away from. (laughs) The luck of fools and idiots. He says, how many careers were cut short because of the stiffness that came out of your generation? Hell, how ma- wait a minute, they're retiring now when they're 28, but how, hell, how many wrestlers were butchered? Listen to this one. How many wrestlers were butchered from your generation because some petty prick in the locker room put out a hit on them? He thinks he's in the Sopranos. Somebody in the locker room put a hit out on some wrestler that caused him to be butchered. 
except for New Jack, and he was doing that of his own volition. Uh, he continues, except for in Mexico, which is where he spent a lot of his time, which may explain why he's got brain damage. Because there are a bunch of untrained, unregulated dipshits down there, too. Except, and that's where Jack Evans apparently picked up that fucking skeletal remains of a partner of his, and Angelico. <laughs> Except for in Mexico, hits don't even happen in wrestling anymore. Wow, I wasn't aware they ever happened to begin with in any responsible organization. Once again, we're talking about playing with the fucking kids. Who, but Brian, what, what legendary wrestler have you ever heard of do a shoot about the hits that he put out on other wrestlers in the locker room? It's kind of like this guy read like a sleazy message board thread. Yes. About wrestling's past and figured that's what it was because he wasn't around any of that. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't even happen in wrestling anymore except for in Mexico. So cut the crap with these tall tales of how things used to be. Us old heads who survived the shit your generation gave us are not going to stand by and yet let you shovel it on the youngins now. Wow. And the first response I see is his generation at least knew how to wrestle and didn't have to exclusively rely on high-flying or gymnastics routines. At least his generation was watchable and didn't resemble a tumbling act. At least the guys working today will like to see 60 without massive neurological disorders, blah, blah, blah. What the fuck? Well, that's the thing. He's not attacking Lance as much as Lance's entire generation. So it's not even just yes. about Lance. There are some valid things to say when it comes to Clearly, there are less guys addicted to painkillers nowadays. Clearly, the rings are easier to use. There's a lot of differences. But if we're going based on the when the business was the safest. Well, I, I have to take exception to that. The rings are better in the WWF than they were before 1997, but nobody else really changed their fucking rings. We always had good rings in Mid-South. Dallas sucked. But Mid-South, Crockett, WCW, they had good rings. Okay. Ring of Honor had a great ring, and then I built him a better ring. Um, the, no, it's just that this fucking idiot is a five foot eight, hundred and fifty fucking pound average white guy that can do a lot of gymnastics, and he fails at more than he attempts, or most of what he attempts in every match. And this is the guy that some people would bring up when, remember when Ring of Honor. Almost went out of business because Kerry Silken was pouring money down a well. This is the fucking guy and people like him that those fans that did exist go, well, back when Ring of Honor was great and had guys like Jack Evans and so-and-so. Yeah, when it almost bankrupted the owner because only a small group of people want to see children engaging in sloppy gymnastics. It's not even good gymnastics. Hey, when I was a kid... Ed Sullivan show, and now, right here on our stage, the Chinese acrobats of Taiwan. I was glued to that shit. They were amazing. I didn't believe they were fighting. I believed they were working together in an intricate way, and they nailed everything. It was very impressive. This fucking clown is neither fighting nor nailing everything in an impressive fashion. He's going out there making the wrestling business look phony, and then fucking half the time he falls on his face and half the time he falls on somebody else's face. So I'd rather have somebody that knows what they're doing haul off and hit me with a chair over the top of my head than be laying in the middle of the ring and let this fucking lunatic drop in from the sky at whatever fucking pike position with three tilt-a-whirls in midair and have his knee land in my goddamn nose and give me brain damage forever. Fuck. What is this this idiot? He thinks that what he does is acceptable. And everybody else was all fucked up. He thinks that wrestling is safer today. It's a, We almost have to have a segment on the program where we go through the fucking injured, hospitalized, and retired list on a weekly basis because these guys try so much that they can't do and can't do well or shouldn't be doing to begin with. And it's simply the luck of the fucking law of gravity that they don't paralyze themselves more often. So anyway, I said some things to Jack Evans that he didn't fucking like on Twitter. 
And he had the nerve to bow back up at me once, whereupon that I then told him to go fuck himself, and here's what I think of you. And then everybody started tweeting pictures of him jumping off the top rope, doing three flips, and landing on his head on the fucking floor. I don't care if he wants to do that to himself, but I'll be goddamned if I would be underneath him when he's coming down with his track record. Because there's a good way to fucking butcher somebody or put a hit out on somebody. Don't don't tell a 300-pound shooter, hey, go fuck this guy up. Just book him with Jack Evans and let him cannonball his 150 pounds off the top rope on your fucking face or nuts. Fuck you, Jack Evans. And, and the Angelico you rode in on. I don't think you're looking at him the right way. I don't think you're seeing the genius of Jack Evans. In a business with so many gymnasts, so many acrobats, you never stop because you hate it so much to realize how different so many of them are. And what I mean is, like a Nick Jackson from the Young Bucks, whatever you want to say about him, he's smooth. He hits his stuff. Whatever he does... Rarely does he miss it. Rarely does he hurt an opponent that we see. True. Nick Jackson looks like he's, he, he's like the Chinese acrobats of Taiwan. Yeah, he's the guy you would see at the gymnastics meet. I see Jack Evans more of like the subway gymnasts. Like you're trying to get to work and there's just like this guy and his weird dancing friend that come into the subway car. One guy starts doing like flips, but he's sloppy. He's kicking people in the head. He's falling down. And then they want some change and then they go to the next car. Wait a minute, I'll translate that for all the people who don't live in the Northeast. Say you're walking by the park. <laughs> and you're walking your dog, and there's a bunch of fucking lunatic goofball white guys probably trying to dance that are way too old and ought to have jobs, but instead they're out there begging for money and trying to dance and not doing a very good job of it. Same thing, different part of the country. I literally think that's their gimmick. I thought that before this whole thing, but when I watched them on TV, they just seem like street dancers or something. So you're saying that they're <laughs> fucking up on purpose because all the other gymnasts actually hit their shit and we've gotten used to it, but the yeah. way that they get rewound and their footage get spread around is if they actually fuck up royally and fall on their own heads. They'll never get the height of a Mark Quinn. They'll never have the grace of a Nick Jackson. They, he, but what can Jack Evans do better than them? He could land on their face and land on his own face at the same time. Better than they can. You may have a point, Brian. You may have a point. I'd never thought of it that well. In that case, Jack, keep doing what you're doing. You're a, you're a big success, Jack. Anyway, did you see? You didn't watch it, did you? The WWE Treasures episode from last week with Brutus Beefcake and Greg the Hammer Valentine. I have it on my DVR. I sadly uh -huh. have not gotten a chance to watch it yet. I didn't even realize until we talked briefly before we recorded that it was Beefcake and Valentine. Now I really want to see it. Yeah, because this... It, everything that we've said about the Treasures program was magnified in this episode. There was, like, they were... There was no effort whatsoever in finding any of this stuff. They knew right where it was. But, um... They were going for, because the dream team, Beefcake and Valentine, um, they were going for Beefcake's scissors. They were going for Greg Valentine's robe and the shin guard that he used on the, the figure four and, you know, a couple of, and they took a couple of side stories. But again, it was wonderful to see Lance Russell on uh, on a and e television almost every week lance russell is now on national television and a picture of uh hogan and eddie boulder his brother and lance that from memphis tv that they showed was my picture so i saw even a little of my own work on this program it helped lighten the mood did they license it from you um you know i signed a thing god whenever when when did hogan write that fucking bullshit biography of his Oh, that was a long time. That was like, a long time ago. Yeah, because he ago. had some of he had some of my pictures from back then. I, so I signed a thing he could use my pictures in his book. I'm sure that's he just still leeching off of that. But anyway, I don't care. Um, Stephen Pino. Stephen Pino. Um, but they showed footage, and this is it, it's amazing. We just talked about Greg Valentine a minute ago. 
you go back and you see, and I like beefcake. I've never had any problems with him as a person or any crosswords or whatever, but beefcake was so classic over the top cartoony eighties, WWF wrestler, just the facial expressions. And he reminds me of, of, of Harpo on AEW now the the bug eyes the facial expressions the the whole thing with the shears and the scissors and the strut and the whole and the the outfits complete cartoon 80s WWF everything that gimmick was everything that the reason why I didn't watch 80s WWF not knocking beefcake as a person but it just it was a cartoon and then you they showed Valentine from the Carolinas he was so good not flashy, but everything was solid. Everything was there. He worked like his dad, Big John. Everything looked real. He drew a ton of money with Piper, drew him and Flair with the Andersons. I mean, he was a money-making machine in the Carolinas for what? For that four or five-year run. And so it was the classic example of Valentine, who is – was so good in the Carolinas with serious wrestling presentation goes up there and beefcake was saying, well, I was the, the new guy, the young guy, I get to be put with a legend like Valentine, but with Valentine, it, it gave him some appeal for the WWF fans at the time that just wanted to see the guys on ice cream bars. So, but it wasn't a great tag team. I'm not saying that, but each one of them had, you know, at least a contrast. Um, Shawn Michaels had to take the place of Triple H on this program where he sits at the, at the, uh, warehouse in Stamford and talks to people on Skype. I guess Triple H was doing the, the investors call or whatever. Uh, but like I said, there, go ahead. I was going to say, it is amazing how the relationship switched from Triple H being his little buddy. Yeah. Kind of the other way around. (laughs) Yeah. Now Michaels is the little buddy and Triple H is the leader of the treehouse. Um, (laughs) So re- refresh me. They showed Brutus Beefcake and Greg Valentine, the heel dream team. And then they switched. They kind of glossed over the way that he switched baby face and the whole barber thing. But it came from a hair match, right? A hair match stipulation. And he won. Somebody else got their hair cut. Is that the way they started the barber? What happened was he ran in at the finish of Piper Adonis. At WrestleMania 3, Roddy Piper's retirement match, loser gets their head shaved. Allegedly, it didn't happen. They learned the hard way what happens when you try to cut hair after a sweaty match. And <laughs> I could have given him some clues on that when I'd done it a few years before. There had just been an incident where Adrian Adonis had fucked with his hair. So at the end of the match, he had just broken up with the Dream Team because if you thought the team of Beefcake and Valentine was unappealing... Get ready for Valentine and Dino Bravo, Ooh. which was the replacement dream team. And he was kind of in limbo. So a couple matches later, he runs out, wakes Piper up. He'd been put to sleep. Piper wakes up, cuts Adonis's hair. And because of his participation, he decided to become a barber. <laughs> All right. Well, I knew it was some point is this is fucking for the per- person who liked 80s wwf that's the kind of stuff that they liked um so basically they're looking for greg valentine's robe the 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 hammer the the big one the famous one that he wore a long time he had a lot of them with flair but he got the big one with uh when he was up there with the wwf miss olivia uh johnny walker's wife wrestling two's wife was the one who made all those robes she was a uh, they showed pictures of her and and uh, a bit of her doing that, but uh, she was a genius, and that's where all those high priced robes came from. And I was at Flair and Valentine had a contest at one time as, as who could spend the most money. Flair spent five, Valentine spent six, and Flair spent seven. Anyway, uh, so they're looking for Valentine's robe, beefcakes, clippers and Valentine's shin guard and some boots. And I wrote, how hard should any of this be? What wrestler keeps no no boots and his greatest robe ever? Or what wrestler doesn't keep any of his boots or his best or whatever? Come to find out it's Valentine. So they first go to Louisiana to the friend of Valentine's that he sold the hammer robe to. So he knew right where it was, but he sold it to this guy in Louisiana. They value the robe at ten to fifteen thousand dollars. 
according to wow. AJ and WWE treasures. No. AJ knows his stuff. What the fuck? He he paid <laughs> Miss Olivia between seven and ten for it. And when it was brand new, before it was ever worn on national television, pay per view, and etc. So their valuations. And uh, hey, but they uh, go to, who, who are you to doubt AJ? Oh God! And we're not talking. We're not talking about Styles. We're talking about host AJ. He's the same guy that was going to buy a WrestleMania three ring with Jake Roberts because. Jake, you'll be able to recognize this ring. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Go pick out that ring, Jake. But anyway. I've seen Jake a couple of times. He couldn't recognize that he was in the ring. I've seen Jake pawn a ring. I don't know about identify a ring. Anyway, so they go into Guy's house in Louisiana. And actually, he did have a cool collection of some things. My WWF figure, the old one, was sitting in the middle of all the figures on the guy's shelf. He's got Dennis Condry's boots, got Tom Pritchard's boots. And then they went into a um, a side note where Beefcake told his parasailing story. And good Lord, that was just gruesome. Um, and the moral of the story, of course, is don't party with Brian Blair. <laughs> but everybody knows what happened, right? Or should we mention this? People know he was in an accident, but I've always found that people actually don't know the details of what happened to him. He's at the beach in the ocean in the water, minding his own business, when some idiots... No. A, what? <laughs> Wasn't it the girl that Brian Blair brought to hang out with them at the beach? The well, lake? I was just going to say some idiots trying to parasail, <laughs> but it was a girl that hit him. But nevertheless, the girl parasailing behind the boat, they're revving up, and somehow she has turned sideways, and he turns around, and there she's coming, and as she's lifting off the ground, her knees hit him smack in the face at about 60 miles an hour, and caved his entire face in, and broke every bone in his face, and his blood came out every orifice, and they they had to, at one point, didn't think they were going to be able to save him. And then he said on the show, he said, one doctor said, I, I think I can do something. And so then after they told that story, they added to it the mask. Remember the mask when it was him and Hogan against whoever at WrestleMania? Money, Inc. Money, Inc. And he had to use the protective mask because that was the first time he came back. So listen to this. Valentine's robe that he paid between seven and ten grand for brand new was valued at ten to fifteen, but this fucking mask that Beefcake used one time on a pay-per-view in Hulkamania colors, red and yellow, was valued at three to five thousand dollars. <laughs> uh and uh, here's another thing I don't like about the fucking host, AJ. He's like everybody else on this show. They have to keep saying the words character and storyline. They can't say, well, because Money Inc. did this to Beefcake's face here on television. He came back wearing this mask in the storyline. So-and-so was responsible. Fuck you, AJ. How about that? You are grating on me. And so is Stephanie, to be quite honest. The character. If I hear this words character and storyline on this television show one more time, I'm going to put a hit out on somebody. I know they still do them in Mexico, so I've heard. Anyway, so... AJ offers $10,000 for the robe and the mask. And the guy says he wants time to think about it, so they go out to eat jambalaya in the yard. <laughs> um, No, I'm not kidding. They went out and ate jambalaya in the yard. Uh, and the guy took 15, finally, after the jambalaya. Um, a lot of reminiscing by Greg Valentine and Brutus Beefcake. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote, no, they make wrestling seem faker on this show than the local TV news exposés used to in the 70s. Uh, then they went to Roger in Boston. I think I've met Roger. I know I've met Roger at, 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 a, at, at, at least one, if not more fan fests up there. And he's a big collector and he had the beefcake shears. And apparently beefcake sold him the shears. I mean, why do these, these key, these guys keep none of their shit. No wonder they have to go looking for it on this television program. Uh, guess what the shears were valued at, according to AJ. Oh, geez, according to AJ, seventy five hundred. Well, for once, you're wrong. Twenty five hundred to five thousand dollars. Again, 
It's a it's gardener shears that he taped with red and white tape on the handles. And here's here's a Miss Olivia robe, seventy five hundred, but the fucking taped up garden shears were five grand. Anyway, Roger wanted thirty five hundred, and I believe he got it. So then they go to Tampa because where else would you be in this show without Jimmy Hart to look through some boxes? And, and Jimmy took him this time to Hogan's Beach Shop. I'm thinking Jimmy is working some kind of deal where he has stuff on everybody stashed in every store in Florida. Because remember last week he went to another a record store. They had stuff of his in the back <laughs> in boxes. Now he's at Hogan's Beach Shop. They get stuff in the back in boxes. Jimmy is going to live forever on the shit that he's got stored in various places in Florida. So they go to Hogan's Beach Shop. They go in the back. Jimmy opens up two boxes and guess what he finds? A shin guard of Greg Valentine's and he he donates the shin guard again he never makes any money he just gives them this shit and then finally they end up on this cross country whirlwind tour back at Greg Valentine's house for a pair of boots and he offers them or offer AJ offers Greg a thousand dollars for a pair of his boots and he takes it $1,000 for Greg Valentine's boots? Certainly he could do better than that on the open market. What the fuck? Huh, you sure you want to watch this program? Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. But that was uh, that was the recap and the roundup. I'd like to see them get one collector that's going to be like, you know what, fuck you. How about a million dollars? <laughs> Get out of here with your stupid camera crew and your overexcitement about the stupidest shit. Well, when they first, the producer, what was her name, first called me way back early, before the pandemic even. I was like, well, wait a minute. Do do we actually have to sell this stuff? Because I've got some shit that I treasure, but I wouldn't want to fucking sell it. I said, like, are we working here or would you really be buying it? Because And then the pandemic... I, I can't remember the, her exact words, so I don't want to misquote anybody. But uh, they never actually said that uh, they had to buy it or they they didn't. But we didn't got get that far, and then the pandemic came in. So there you go. But uh, and th they were the the Kane and Undertaker episode. That's the one they asked me. Do we do you have any posters from that show? We didn't do posters in Knoxville. It's a big town. We did TV commercials, and that's why I was like, as far as memorabilia i've got the original fucking vhs dub from the truck i could show it to you but <laughs> that's where they, they then they went and found the from glenn the original unibomb outfit and and all that other stuff but speaking of kane and this is unrelated and i didn't even think about it till now somebody sent a clip have you seen this i don't know what it's on but it's apparently or from, rather. It's apparently one of the documentaries on the WWE Network. I don't know if it's on Kane or it just Kane was one of the subjects of it, but it's got a clip from the studio ring in Stamford of me showing Kane how to do the sit-up. And somebody tweeted that, and it had a graphic original training footage of Kane, like it came from a documentary. Have you seen that? I have not seen that. I'm going to guess it may be the Kane documentary, because what else would it be? Well, I, I have not seen the Kane documentary, to be honest with you. And I didn't. Here's what I'm scared about what else might be on there, because remember, I've said here on this program that, Eva, yes, I've got hornswoggled into the scene and beyond the mat. And you see me peripherally in some documentaries, but there has never been video footage released of me going over finishes with opponents or showing guys how to, to do basically that inside the business, exposing the business, that inside. I have uh, avoided that to my knowledge. Apparently not. And this was not a manned camera shot because here's the thing in Stamford, when they put up the studio at the ring, that or the studio at the ring, when they put up the ring at the studio, that was where the original Dr. Tom Pritchard and Dory Funk Jr. camps 
were held with the guys like Mark Henry and Kurt Angle and, and, you know, all of the tryout camps with the, in the late nineties until we moved everything to OVW. And there was a VHS camera set up on a, on a tripod and it was always running so that Tom or Dory or any, whatever you were doing, it could be gone back and looked at later on if, if you needed to show somebody something, right? It just an unmanned VHS camera. It was never meant to be on television. Obviously, in those days, never meant to be in documentaries because even then they didn't show footage of, of that type in public. And so I probably didn't even think about it running. And we all, we all knew that it was running, but we knew that it was never to go anywhere because we're having a wrestling school class teaching guys how to work. So apparently they got it from that. And this wasn't even a class. I remember doing this. And I the reason I saw it, I saw it on somebody sent a clip on Twitter and just said, is this you, Jim Cornette? I'm like, holy fuck. It's a small grainy picture and it's just the wide VHS shot. But that was the early, I don't even know if it was, if it was before Hell in a Cell or shortly after, but Glenn's debut as Kane. But part of the deal was doing the sit up like Undertaker. And part of the deal was him having the mannerisms. And I know this is going to sound odd, but he wasn't doing the sit up the right way. And I know everybody's going, okay, Jim Cornette was going to teach Glenn Jacobs how to do a sit up. Look at our various physiques. That's not the point. It's not an uh, exercising sit up, it's the Michael Myers Halloween spooky monster movie sit up. And if you can imagine this, a lot of guys, when they try to imitate that, when they're laying there, when they sit up, their feet will come slightly off the mat and their arms will kind of with the momentum and they'll kind of, they'll sit up. But if you go back and look the way, the reason why Michael Myers was spooky, the reason why Undertaker was spooky, the reason why then Kane got it is because you have to be laying there motionless straight as an air, like you're laid out in a coffin. And then the only thing that can move is your waist. Like there's a hinge on it. Your feet don't move. Your hands at your sides don't move. Your, your elbows bend when your waist bends and your head stays the exact same angle straight up and down as when you're laying. And it's just, well, remember like they were bringing in, old Alistair Black on that uh, Hannibal Lecter board and the board tipped up. Yeah. Straight, same thing, straight at the waist, boom. And when you come straight up, then the only thing that moves is the neck when you do the turn and look. Hmm. So it's two moves. Everything else has to be motionless. Bend up at the waist, stop, turn to the side with the head. And Glenn was moving his feet a little bit and kind of his hands would move. And also when he was sitting up, he started turning his head before he was all the way set up. And I said, no, I said, stock still, two distinct movements. That's the spooky part. And he did it about two or three times and got it. And that was, but I never dreamed that 20 something years later I'd see, and we were the only two in the ring. There wasn't even a class going on, as I recall. So, but somehow now that's out there. So if that's, so that's out there, what other footage do you think they have? Like the funking dojo stuff and. Oh, well, they've got it all. They just haven't. I mean, and I would be highly surprised if somebody threw those tapes away because they used to save everything else. That's why they've got a giant fucking warehouse. The question is, you know, will anybody ever see it or did they ever transfer it or whatever? But anyway, you know what? Even if we don't have these videos, Brian, even if we don't have transfers of these VHS tapes or whatever, we've still got our memories and not only our memories, but also we can have paintings to back these things up. That's exactly right. Not just paintings, but fantastic custom-made oil paintings. By world-class artists. Paintings of your life, ladies and gentlemen, with Paint Your Life. And folks, now more than ever, there's still time also to at least get the order in before Father's Day. If you want a custom, professional, hand-painted portrait created from any photograph at an affordable plot price, done by a team of world-class artists, 
ordered in minutes with a quick and easy process and delivered to you in about three weeks, just go to paintyourlife.com. We've said it so many times, they can take any picture, yourself, your kids, your family, a special place, a loved pet, or multiple pictures and combine them into one painting. Bring family generations together. Put yourself in your favorite place that you can't visit anymore because it's closed or it's out of business or you just don't want to go. Whatever you want, paint your life can paint it. It's your life, so you tell them what you want. Perfect birthday gift, anniversary gift, wedding gift, Father's Day, whatever. And right now, right now, we don't know how much longer this is going to last, but right now, if you text the word DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, I know this is the experience, but we're keeping track of these things this way. Drive, D-R-I-V-E to 64,000. That's drive to 64 with three zeros. Drive to 64,000. You're going to get 20% off your painting and free shipping. And at paintyourlife.com, there's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, they give you a refund guaranteed. 20% off and free shipping. Text the word drive to 64,000 and go to paintyourlife.com and celebrate the moments that matter most. Terms apply. Available at paintyourlife.com slash terms. That's right. A fantastic gift for all. You know, Brian, I'm kind of sad because the end has come of the series of biographies on A&E and that though they were definitely more popular than the current wrestling programs because the ratings showed that they were doing better ratings than current wrestling does and they actually were fun to watch and and you know you see some shit you actually want to see instead of stuff you sit through and i think the bret hart one was the best one of the bunch what did you think i think so too i loved it we'll talk about it in a moment i think the two that really stood out were the bret hart and the cactus jack or the mick foley ones because they were the two positive ones really there was no tragedy i mean well i shouldn't say there was no tragedy but it ended on an uplifting note yeah, and a positive note, and it left you feeling good about things. I think the Bret Hart one was easily the best, and uh, I went into this with Bret Hart being one of my all-time favorite wrestlers at the very top of the list, and I come out of this, and, you know, all these years later, his stuff holds up. Everything you see with him, yeah, he did it the right way. I'm sorry. I love Bret Hart. I think he's great in the ring. I appreciate every time I hear him comment on stuff. I usually find that I agree with him. And when you watch his stuff, I know some of the guys would say in interviews and stuff that he was a mark for himself and this and that, or he took things seriously. There should be more Bret Hart's. He did things the right way. I love Bret Hart. Yeah, and I've changed my tune because I was one of the guys 20 years ago. I was like, Bret takes everything too seriously. But now that I've seen what can happen when that horse leaves the barn, I'm firmly in his corner too. Um, you know, it... <laughs> He did. He wasn't a mark. A lot of the guys would say, and a lot of the guys were jealous because he was on top, making more money, whatever. But uh, he wasn't a mark for himself. He just took everything seriously, and it was uh, combined that with Canadians are notoriously a little dry, and it came off like that he he believed that he was really who he was, but instead, actually. <sighs> He really believed in who he was. It, it You can look at it two different ways. And so now that I've seen, we, you know, it was, it was crazy with him and Michaels and the whole thing. And we're not going to, when we talk about this show, we're not even going to relitigate Montreal. We'll skip over all that because I'm tired of it. It's on every program. But at the same time, you can't, you can't blame him for his motivation. Would not want to put Sean over. And we all know all the machinations that were going on behind the scenes. But besides that, that was a personal stand that Brett took. Just, I'm not going to put this prick over because he doesn't respect me. Any other problems with stuff that he had or, or anything it was due to, he wanted to be taken seriously and for the business to be taken seriously. And he had pride in it. And, you can't argue with that anymore because you look back at this stuff. It hits you on this show. How many great WWF matches that Brett was in and how much better all of the guys from that era stuff looked than it does today. 
how much more the people are into it, how much better they just looked as stars, and how much better the work looked, and how much more serious people were taking it. And it's just a it's like that guy we spoke about earlier in the in the show with a friend that hadn't watched wrestling in, in 20 years was a fan of of Crockett. So now he tuned in and is like, what? It's a shock. And it's the same way. We've gotten used to it. I remember what it used to look like. We've gotten used to this stuff we're watching now. And you go back and you understand why that 10 times as many people were watching that as watch this, because it looked 10 times better. And it was presented 10 times more seriously and not like a bunch of kids playing around. So Brett was ahead of his time. I I didn't realize there was going to be a time where nobody in the wrestling business would take themselves seriously at all or the business seriously at all. So I apologize for ever saying Brett took himself too seriously. Anyway, um, I loved the family pictures. I loved, you know, Stu making the breakfast. <clears throat> I think Kenny Wayne was the first one to tell me a story about Stu Hart cooking. And he was the one that told me about, you know, he's flipping the fucking eggs with a spatula and they got 20 cats and the cat shit's on the counter and he just takes the spatula and shoves the cat shit over and then keeps flipping the eggs. So many people have that story. Is there a chance Stu was just ribbing people? I mean, is it true? No, no, because here's why I know. Because, like I said, when I managed Danny Davis and Ken Wayne in Memphis, they had been as a team to Calgary. And they had Calgary tapes. That was how I first, um, really, when they, because Danny Davis was an early VHS tape owner himself. And he used to, that's how I've got some of those Jackson, Tennessee shows. He lived in Jackson, used to tape them and give them to me. And I would tape some of his stuff or give him Japanese stuff or whatever. But anyway, that's, so that's how I got some of those Memphis house shows that never survived any other way. But anyway, um, we were watching one Calgary tape and Stu on a lot of the TVs would sit ringside with Ed Whalen. If, if I don't know whether he's timekeeping or just wanted a close look at the matches, but right. I, I think it was Danny said, watch this. Cause they'd seen the tape. The heels do some kind of goddamn hot stuff and people are throwing drinks and they throw popcorn like they used to do at the heels. His fucking full bag of popcorn lands on the apron in front of Stu and on television on the wide shot while all this shit's going on in the ring, Stu reaches up and starts eating the popcorn off the (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, you know, but they went into some background and this actually, God, I, it, I guess it's kind of back in history and how would you reenact or do any of this, but Stu Hart's childhood could be a dark side of the ring. And they had, you know, mentioned Brett was talking about it and some footage, just generic stock footage of of the time period. But when Stu was a kid, his father moved out to some piece of land in Saskatchewan in like in the 19 teens when it was still the Wild West and got was going to homestead a farm or whatever and got screwed on a land deal and found out he didn't really own the land. And instead of leaving, going back to wherever, because they had no money, they were dirt poor, they started living in a tent and then built a shack and lived in that. And they mentioned Stu and his brothers and sisters, his mother and father, in the Saskatchewan winters in the 19-teens and 20s, where it gets 40 below and six feet of snow and whatever. And the only way they lived was by going out and hunting squirrels and rabbits and bullshit. That's it. So Stu Hart's childhood was part of the thing that formed him as, as who he was. And you've got this kindly father of a dozen who makes breakfast for the kids. And at the same time, he loves to fucking pop guys joints down in the basement and make them cry and scream and shit themselves in pain because it's, it's their wrestling hobby. So, you know, they could have gone into more detail on that for me. That's just an amazing story. Uh, did did you notice they never mentioned Paul Bosch's name in the introduction of Stu and Helen Hart? Right. And of course, that is my hometown, Long Beach, New York. Helen Hart's name was Helen Smith. The Smith family was a prominent family in town. Paul Bosch, 
grew up in Long Beach after moving there from Brooklyn with his family, was the head of lifeguards, wrestling in New York with, I believe, Stu Hart and also Lord James Blears and I want to say Sandar Kovacs, but I could be wrong with the... Uh, was the it Sammy one. Stein? No, I don't think it was Sam. He may have been the work in the territory, but he wasn't one of the four guys on the beach. But they come out to the beach. Paul Bosch introduces Stu to Helen. He also introduces Lord James Blears to his future wife. And he's the key connector there. But no, his name was never mentioned. They still hold a grudge. Anyway, um, <laughs> I wish they could have gone inside Hard House just having Brett standing outside. I want to see the layout of what that place looked like. Um, what did they say? 22 rooms? 22 rooms. It was a, it previously had been a Red Cross uh, hospital for, I guess, uh, service people. And gosh, you can see now because it used to sit on, I don't know how many acres, but all by itself out on that big hill. And now there's, they've sold the property around it and there's apartments and developments all around it. But the house itself is, I guess, got historic status, right? I think so, yeah. I th I, at least I thought so, but I'm not sure. But uh, they had great footage of Victoria Pavilion. Um, and, you know, those classic wrestling venues of the territory days that it wasn't the biggest place in the world, but they ran it every week. So, you know, a lot of those territories, and Calgary was never known for major big crowds, just for steady, consistent business. But those those cool buildings like that that could seat you know, 2,500, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 in that range, that was everywhere from the Amarillo Sports Arena to the Hippodrome in Nashville to the Victoria Pavilion in Calgary, and they'd pack them every week. I thought it was funny that Brett and his brothers, when they were growing up, the wrestling kids of Stewhart, they had to fight other kids in school to defend wrestling, which, you know, every every wrestler's kid did and did. They had to fight and did fight to defend wrestling. But by the time that Brett and the brothers are grown up and in the business, they're the local fucking heroes and the international celebrities and the whole city of Calgary's fawning all over. And it, 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 different times, I get times change because before then the, the business was healthier in Calgary and they had, you know, 3000 people a week or whatever the fuck in the good times going to the matches. But, there was a segment of, of people in town that thought, ah, oh, those goofy wrestlers. But then later on, they see Brett and Owen on TV, on pay-per-view around the world, and it's a big deal, but they can't draw 3,000 people a year <laughs> unless it's a WWF show in Calgary. So uh, that's uh, times change. Um, do you like the, the video of Stu and Helen in the office? That was fun, answering the the phone, the 70 Stampede TV, the dungeon stuff with the famous tape recording, and there's Natty Neidhart talking about, yeah, we're up here drinking tea, and they're down there screaming and pooping themselves. Um, I didn't know about Brett's short career as a teenage filmmaker, the giant lizard movie. <laughs> I'm glad there's still a print of that around. And... Do you know, as soon as I saw the, I don't know whether it was his actual debut match, but his, when he broke in in 78, one of his first matches there, I immediately thought he physically resembled an in-shape George Goulas. Oh, come on. No, serious. Go back and look. He's, he's in better condition, but he's still so tall and gangly and thin. He doesn't look anything like, and it's not to say Brett was a big steroid guy and all of a sudden gained a hundred pounds, he just filled out in a reasonable way better than you would look at, at that frame at the time and say, oh boy. I remember his first matches I saw in Japan in what, 80, 81? He even got a, mask, a match with Tiger Mask over there when they yeah. did the big tour with Dynamite. And he was a little bit bigger, but he was still awfully pale. That's but kind he, of the thing. He came in. You know, that's one of the interesting things, you know, looking back on Brett today, and I'm a big fan of his work. He's one of my very favorite of all time, like I said before, and I think he's one of the best of all time. And when you look at the early 80s in Japan, there was so much focus on Dynamite Kid and Tiger Mask. And of course, then Davy Boy came in and there were two British wrestlers, future Bulldogs. Brett was kind of lost in the shuffle. He was there, but there were a lot of people raving about Brett versus Tiger Mask. 
No, he just got on that tour because of the Calgary guys. He was along with, you know, Dynamite and Davey at that time. Yeah. But, but, but he'd only been in business three years. So, and had never wrestled really anywhere else. So, you know, no big deal. I, the Calgary rings, the ropes, are those cloth sleeves of some description <laughs> covering the rope? No, I'm asking. I don't know. I don't know. And I've always seen it. It's always been weird to me, but traditionally, at least in the States, there was two kinds of rings. Everybody except the WWF and, and Vern and the AWA, because they had the the lineage from using the old boxing rings. Their rings were 20 foot square and had ropes, real ropes, that they would then tape with colored duct tape. And that's why you could still see on the WWF or on the AWA shows, you can still see the actual texture of real rope under the taping. Everywhere else in the country, especially the NWA, used 18-foot square rings and quarter-inch steel airplane cable in garden hoses. And since that was the first kind of ring that I was ever in and the only kind I was ever in for so long, I naturally, I like those better. The ropes are easier that you can't fuck yourself up as bad because you got more support and they don't spring around as much and it makes the action quicker and they're much cheaper because you don't have to replace them as often. And you wrap the garden hose in duct tape as well, just to give it the color you wanted or a little bit of, you know, of, uh, uh, so it wouldn't be so slick. You're roughing up the surface a little bit with that duct tape. But I've never seen any ropes like Calgary's where it looked like they had some type of cloth or material sleeve of some kind that they they appeared to be real ropes, but they were you can't hit real ropes without rope burning your fucking ass off, right? So that you got to cover them with something. But it just, it looked strange to me. I don't know why I've gone on this long about that, but I've never seen him look like that anywhere else. Anyway, um, wouldn't you know who won the pony? They covered Stu Selling's Calgary stampede in 1984, but not Vince reneging on that deal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or the resurrections of stampede wrestling. I guess because he was going to renege on the other deal. They did They didn't... Say, well, Brett, remember when your dad sold his company to Vince 13 years ago and he fucked him too? Anyway. Plus the whole narrative of, well, Brett had been working hard and now he finally got his big break working for the WWF. Well, no, he was wrestling in Calgary. He had wrestled in Georgia. He was wrestling in Japan. It wasn't like back then, my big break is going to wrestle for Vince. It wasn't that yet. Yeah, no, that deal was made because if Vince was going to buy Calgary, Stu wanted his four top guys to have a continuing job. And, and, that's, and then Bruce Pritchard was on again. He hemmed and hawed around about, well, Brett, you know, he was he was a great talent, but he just hadn't found himself or he hadn't come out or he didn't have the personality or whatever. He basically hemmed. That's the same way he sounds whenever – that the company can't figure out what to do with somebody and he don't want to say that. So it's the same thing. Well, the personality, like, you know, <laughs> when they had a chance to sign Rhino, when he was 19 years old, I brought him to one of the fucking Funkin' Dojo camps. He's got 34 inch thighs. He does a diving headbutt off the top, like fucking dynamite kid at 260 pounds. He's 19 years old and he's a fucking beast, right? They didn't sign him. Bruce said, well, he doesn't have any personality. God damn, he's 19 years old. He can't drink legally yet either. Sign this fucking guy. He's going to be a star. And of course, then when he became a star for somebody else, then they got him and they got him and they had to pay more for him. But anyway, when he, he hems and haws around with, they had a good technical wrestler that they just threw out there with no plan because they were starting to be the land of cartoon. And, and by, the way, by the way, for the record, Bruce wasn't there. Bruce was still I mean, in Houston. I was about to say, that's the point is Bruce didn't start with the company until they sold the UWF in, in 87, and Brett came in in 84. But Bruce is the company spokesman, so it could have been somebody else hemming and hawing around without saying we couldn't figure out what to do with him because he wasn't a cartoon. But anyway, uh, at least with Neidhart and Jimmy Hart, they clicked, and I can see why, because... 
Neidhart w- w- was hilarious on his promo. He got the promos instantly. We worked with him in Mid South in '84, and he was green and strong as a bull. But his promos were fucking great. And Jimmy Hart, of course, added the showmanship so Brett could be the wrestler. So they got they clicked, and Brett avoided being cut off at the legs because he didn't have a cartoon personality. And then by the time they made him a single, he had to step up his promos, but he was already a name and he had already been used in top positions and people were already used to him. And he also had some more experience. And then and they kind of glossed over that and mixed things up because they tried him and Neidhart both as singles in 88 first. Yeah. And then they put him back together as a tag team for another couple of years. And then Brett got his extended singles run, but they tried it earlier in 88, but it was kind of. When they went to the part with 88, they just jumped to 91 in the documentary. Well, and, and also they, they, they did push that time around that they incorporated Stu Hart and the Hart family and the multi-generational wrestler story that made Brett seem more legitimate. That Because the, I can't remember who made the point, but I think it might have been Edge. But Brett was really the first one of the WWF champions of Vince Jr.'s era, at least, that was kind of a real person. Instead of the fucking say your prayers, take your vitamins, or the ultimate warrior, whatever the fuck, Brett was a real, actual, real wrestler that you could buy as a person and not a gimmick. Um, you know, I think there's a lot which, of... Which went back to the fucking days of Bruno and Pedro and all the real champions that they had. Go ahead. That's what I was going to say. I think there's a lot of comparisons uh, between the way they're portrayed on the wrestling show as being real people and also just the way they took the business seriously. There's a lot of comparisons between Brett and Bruno. And But I'll tell you what, Bruno never had the SummerSlam match with Mr. Perfect, though. Um, <laughs> I was glad they showed a lot of that. I mentioned this before on one of the shows, but that's what I had quit WCW, but I was still living in Charlotte because I was setting up Smoky Mountain. I went over to Bobby Eaton's house and he had got the pay-per-view for the kids to watch. And he said, hey, have you seen the mask? No, I didn't didn't see it. And we watched Bret Hart and Kurt Henning and that w- we both thought it was phenomenal. And I'm even harder to impress than Bobby is. But that's one of those matches that Actually, we've overlooked it, and a lot of people overlook it. When you say, well, great, what well, you think, great WWF matches, the ladder match, the fucking Austin and Brett, you know, double turn, etc. but this was a fucking tremendous wrestling match. And then they followed it up with, that's why I say, how many great matches that Brett was involved in when you sit down and think about it. Then they followed up with SummerSlam 92 with Brett and Davey Boy. And that skips over him and Piper, which is actually my favorite of the three. Oh, sh- well, but but I, I think they, you know, they only had two hours. And how much greatness can we take? Of course. Um, and again, you know, it, it hit me going back and watching the, because I got there on the, they were still doing the, the Bret Hart family feud with Lawler, but I wasn't there for the in inside the family feud, Davey and Brett and Diana being torn and et cetera. I'd seen some of the buildup, but this, this whole angle and the way they did it was what Shitstein aspired to write all the time, but couldn't because this was real and the people involved, their relationship was real and not his phony made up Gaga that people could see through. They'd already established everybody was related. Everybody was inter- was married or everybody was in the family in some kind of way, related by being in-laws, uh, family jealousy. And then they, they shoot out of Davy and Brett to Owen and Brett. And that dynamic and all that stuff that they could do because they were all, they were a wrestling family. They were all smart to it. The people knew the relationships were real, so they couldn't figure out what was a work and what wasn't. That's what, you know, because Shitstein's perception of everything is just marginal, is just on the surface. He he watched Jerry Springer for entertainment. So it's not, he doesn't think about anything deeply at all. And so this kind of stuff is what he wanted to do in the Attitude Era and everywhere else he's ever been turned loose. But he couldn't because all of his was bullshit because he was making it up. 
people weren't related or let's ha let's hire an actor to play so-and-so's mother or whatever, or just not being able to choose the talent that could play off of each other properly. So this was the kind of thing that he aspired to, but he wasn't smart enough, didn't think deep enough and didn't have the ability to do it with people that were established already as having a real relationship because he thought the fans were stupid and they'd buy anything because the, if you'll watch Jerry Springer for entertainment, you are stupid and will buy anything. But the wrestling fans didn't want Jerry Springer. So anyway, I, the, this is one of the, maybe the best family feud, because it's it was always trouble when brothers would turn on each other. Ron and Robert Fuller were babyface and heel a time or two against each other. Um, different families would do it. it to me, it, it, you couldn't pull it off. It didn't work. You could have a match like Dory and Terry did in Japan. We did it one time with Mark and Jay Briscoe in Ring of Honor. Just a match, but you can't have a long program most of the time between family members. It, uh, it, 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 people see through it. Except for, of course, everybody believed that Ole and Gene hated Lars Anderson. Because they did. Because they did. Anyway, um, so basically, it, Brett Nolan highlights. I wrote, God, this looks so much better than anything you can see today. Uh, but did you notice they glossed over the entire, later on that night, the entire Yoko match? I was not seen. Yoko's leg was seen for one second. And a verbal, he won the title and they had a, you know, a shot of him being lifted on everybody's shoulders. Um, While Burt Reynolds and Donnie Wahlberg watch. Yes. From the watch, I will uh, say this. Faded breath. You know, you talk about, and I talked about watching Bret Hart now and as great as he was, and I was always a major fan. His stuff stands out even more now. Not too long ago, maybe a year ago or so, I rewatched that SummerSlam cage match with Owen. That thing is way better than I remembered. And I remember that match being kind of controversial. It wasn't that the match that Dave Meltzer gave five stars and a lot of people said, how can you do that? It's not the same kind of cage match we're used to seeing. But it is one of the best cage matches for that yeah. WWE style of cage match where you have to escape. It's one of the best cage matches ever. Well, it was uh, Brett and Owen, obviously not only were talented, but also motivated and un unselfish in that situation. It was the same reason why there Brett. I remember Brett had a match with diesel. Davey had a match with diesel and then Brett and Davey had a match. Guess which one was the best one. The other two. Well, Davy and Diesel was one of the worst matches I've ever been involved in, and it was for the WWF title. That's the one I went to Vince afterwards and apologized. He said, "Well, why? What? What? What are you sorry for?" I said, "I'm just, I'm just sorry for being involved in that match on pay per view." Brett had good matches with Diesel. I actually think Brett's well, matches with Kevin Nash are better than Sean's matches with Kevin. Well, Nash. I was about to say I can't say that Brett's and Diesel's weren't any good, but it. But the point is, they they were they were good for Diesel matches. They weren't good for Brett matches. But when you had Brett with guys that were athletic and that could go and that knew how to work and wanted to work and were motivated. And it wasn't just because they were family, they were familiar with each other, but it was also because they, they felt the same way about wrestling and they knew what they needed to do to make the match good. So Brett and Davey was fucking tremendous. And Brett also could get Davey to keep his ass in gear and focused. Um, and that's, you know, <laughs> Seeing Brett get choked up that time about getting to work with Owen was sad to me. Um, because, and, and, you know, Owen should have been at, at the quality of those matches and the way that the people were interested in him. He should have been propelled from there on out, but they, they spun their wheels. And every time Owen got on television or got something to do, he stole the fucking show and chewed the scenery up, whatever, and the slammy thing and the whole nine yards. But, I can't believe that five years after that SummerSlam cage match you just talked about, or five years after being beaten Bret Hart clean in the middle of the ring at WrestleMania, we're talking about a fucking guy doing a blue blazer gimmick in mid card matches. That would just, they just fucked Owen and his entire career. And that's even more plain now. Anyway, um, I like the way that they explained. They couldn't really explain, though, Brett turning heel in America. And when he said they, they wanted him to turn heel, which he didn't. He didn't want to turn heel, and he shouldn't have, because 
there's the thing. He was still a huge draw in the UK and in Germany and overseas. And he mentioned it in his book. And some people might think that Brett might be prone to exaggeration. But in this case, no, he was huge, not only overseas, but also in Canada. And it was just the the American fans starting to react to Shawn Michaels and his band of Merry Misfits, you know, grabbing their dicks and jacking off. And it was kind of starting to go the way where Brett was starting to be a little snide to the American fans anyway. So naturally, a brilliant idea is, well, hey, let's run with what they're already reacting to. So that's how it came up. It wasn't a brilliant idea by Vince McMahon or Shitstain. Hey, let's turn him heel in America. It's, hey, let's let's see if we can go with this. And the reason why it worked there is because it wasn't written. It was real reactions from fans. And it was real things that Brett would say in those. I remember the one especially promo that he did that was perfect when he's out there with the rest of the Hart Foundation and they're flying the Canadian flag. And he's basically saying, yeah, the United States, you think you're the greatest country in the world? Well, we in Canada, we take care of our sick and our elderly and our poor. Not like, and it, everything he was saying was true. The United the, the Canada does have health care. Canada does take care of sick people and poor people. The United States, thanks to the Republicans, tells them, fuck you, you're on your own. So the people hearing that, because he was telling the truth and they knew it, they're like, fuck this fucking Canadian anti-American fucker. But still in the UK and Germany and everywhere else in the world where they do all the same things they do in Canada, give people health care and take care of the sick and the old, etc., they're like, we love Bret Hart. And why is this jack-off male stripper going around putting our flag up his nose? And the only reason that that worked was not, like I said, not because it was written, but because it was not only real reactions from the fans, but real statements and promos from the talent. Shawn Michaels was a prick. He's admitted it. And he could give a fuck about the fans or anybody else at that point in time. And people could tell. And it was only really the United States, yes, started for whatever reason reacting to DX because we're that type of people. But really then Austin started getting hot. And then they did the double turn and the U.S. was the first place to go ape shit over Austin. At that time, Brett was still bigger overseas because they knew him and had been longer, but Stone Cold Steve Austin's appeal at first until he became a worldwide sensation was kind of uniquely American. Most countries didn't want a guy at that point that was saying, fuck all of you, <laughs> you know, but the Americans did. So the Canada versus America was perfect because it was real. It wasn't Cody versus Britain, right? We're oh, well, they're fucking British. It wasn't even the countries at odds with each other. It was just the two guys that couldn't stand each other and everybody could see that they really hated each other. And when Brett said, you know, here comes fucking Shawn Michaels, a male stripper, a bad taste, bad for wrestling. That's the way he really felt. That's the way a lot of us felt. And people could tell. And boy, Shawn Michaels now sounds just contrite when he describes everything that he actually said and did back in those days, doesn't he? Oh my God. It, like he completely <laughs> takes responsibility for yeah. everything. And I watched Brett, that and I said, how could Jim stay mad at him? I don't know how he yeah. could do it anymore. Because I don't give a fuck. I don't get <laughs> he had a, he had a chance to impress me 25 years ago and he didn't. So he can go, he can get fucked. As I told the people with the car on my fence, he had a chance to be a fucking human being to me and a lot of people that I liked 25 years ago. And now just because he pissed the rest of the world off so bad that he had to run screaming to an invisible, fictitious, supreme being for fucking redemption. He kissed my big, fat, white ass. As Brett, re Brett called him a lousy, rotten, stinking little degenerate on one of those promos. And that's what he was saying to the fucking people in the locker room. So anyway, uh, Vince McMahon expressed absolutely no remorse. Oh, well, I did what I had to do. <laughs> and then he goes to WCW. I said, we're going to skip over Montreal. 
the hottest guy in the business. Bret Hart, the, not only the hottest guy in the business, but also the highest paid, except for Hulk Hogan, most probably, and whatever Nash was able to cheat Bischoff out of when he heard that he'd signed Bret. Within weeks, he's meaningless after a botched debut, and he's one of the boys, and a year later, he's retired from the business. That, to me, was testimony to everything about WCW at that time period. And Brett, not a Goldberg fan, obviously. Um, and you know, the bad thing is, and I'm not doubting him, because it, it was legitimately that kick that ended his career, the concussion, and then the, probably brought on the stroke. But that didn't even look like as much of a potato as half the guys throw on AEW every fucking TV show. And they're just getting up and walking around. Maybe it's because they're... It's who's delivering they, if, it. Well, if they're showing the signs of brain damage, how would you be able to pick that out? But and also who's delivering it? Yes, because Goldberg was a overgrown adult man. But anyway, um, and I'm I'm I, like a lot of people now that you see it laid out between uh, when you saw Owen's death, the funeral, the family reactions, um, combined with just having the concussion and being out of the ring. That may have been the second Owen's death. May have been the second one of the one-two punch on Brett that. They said Stu and Helen never recovered. I wonder if, you know, it took Brett quite a long time, if ever. I didn't know it was that bad, his stroke three months in a wheelchair. You know, I heard that he had had the stroke riding his bicycle in Calgary and was bad off, but I didn't know that it was that bad. And then uh, basically at the end, after, after 12 years, Brett and Vince reconcile. When Brett comes back to the WWE, he makes up with Sean. And it makes up with Vince and then Vince kicks him in the nuts. And then they have a match with him and Vince. <laughs> and that was the, ha and now he's got a happy ending with a new wife and another giant heart family now is con convening at Brett's house, including his daughter beans and his son blade, who always thought was the greatest children's names in the world, beans and blade. You know, I have to say, and I know we're going to talk about dark side of the ring later, but it really was striking seeing this the same week as the Dynamite Kid episode. Yeah. There have been a lot of interesting matchups. You know, they had the Ultimate Warrior documentaries go up against each other the same week. You had Jake Hidden Treasures the same week. You had the Grizzly Smith special. But this one was really striking. Just Dynamite. Again, you're talking about Brett's former sister-in-law was the one married to Dynamite Kid. And Julie yeah. was in that documentary, too. And just seeing the two different endings and the two different beginnings and the fact that it was all about Dynamite. And it was probably Dynamite, then Davey, then Brett, then Neidhart to most people who were knowledgeable fans back then. And it became really Brett. But just seeing the two different endings, it, it's really striking. Yeah. Well, in Dynamite, in, in, would you say until he put on so much weight from the steroids to go to the WWF? Dynamite may have been the best athletic in-ring worker in the business, the most convincing, most exciting. And it wasn't that he had no psychology either. Everything he did followed mostly the old wrestling psychology of trying to look like a struggle. It's just that he took it so far and uh, changed the pace. Look, he changed the pace, definitely, because he was so fast. But it wasn't like he was just doing ridiculous spots to go out there and like, you know, like they do now, the Ricochet and Will Osprey thing that we tried to watch for 45 seconds, where it was just, it was the, you know, choreographed tumbling. Dynamite, all his shit looked painful and it looked like a struggle and it was more painful probably to his body than it was to anybody else's. But you could also see his work was impeccable. He could drop those knees and heads and elbows from the top rope, and you, I could see that it was safe, but at the same time, it looked devastating. So I think that the thing that slowed him down and probably contributed to the back issue that he had, and we'll talk about that in a second, was gaining all that weight to go to 
the WWF because he was never the the in ring performer at that weight that he was before, and it was more weight to carry around when he was still trying to take all those bumps. Anyway, but like you said, uh, you know, one took the left road, the left fork, and it didn't turn out happy, and the other one took the right fork, and it turned out happy in the end. And I think the probably the biggest difference between Bret Hart and the Dynamite Kid is that Bret, at the end of the program, had all that family around him, like another Hart house there in Calgary, and they were all having a nice family get-together. And you know, in the summertime, Brian, Father's Day, family get-togethers, people out and about, in the outdoors, Bret Hart probably hosts some great cookouts, great grilling. And if, if Dynamite Kid had had a family around him to have great cookouts too, he would have ended up the same way. Don't you think that it's best when you have your family around you to just get out and grill? Yes. Yes, you do. I'm glad you agreed with me on that. Well, folks, if you want to get out and grill, and if you don't want to get out your wallet and pay a lot of money for it, Boy, howdy, have we got some news for you. Our friends at Omaha Steaks, we've been talking about them. Omaha Steaks is a, a famous name in the meat industry. It's not just steak. It's the best steak of your life. I just had one a couple of nights ago, as a matter of fact. I would have had more, but Stacy wanted one too. We popped out a couple of those New York strips. Oh, my gosh. I uh, got uh, fancy and cooked a couple of scallops on the sides. We had the surf and turf, and then some of the Omaha steak sides, including those incredible steakhouse fries. But anyway, I digress. The point is, summertime is here. Father's Day is here. And at omahasteaks.com, if you go there right now and type JCE in the search bar, you can order dad or yourself or anybody else the get out and grill assortment. Brian, have you heard about this? This is new even for us. 59% off, not half off, 59% off, which for those of you mathematically challenged individuals out there, that's more than half. The get out and grill assortment includes 20 entrees like the ultra juicy burgers, the plump chicken breasts, the sides, the desserts, and those four 10-ounce butcher's cut New York strips that I was talking about, they're aged for 30 days, but they don't age long in my house. They get eaten pretty quick. And if you get this package, you also get four free New York strip burgers with that order. It's selling out fast, so don't wait. It's like a Cornette's collectible. Again, the Get Out and Grill assortment, 59% off with 20 entrees plus sides and desserts and free for, for free, free for, you'll get them for free, the for free New York Strip Burgers. What the hell? How can they do this and stay in business? Go to omahasteaks.com, use the keyword JCE, for free burgers, 59% off the package. I'm surprised they don't send somebody to your house to cook them for you. And from what I've heard about your cooking, Brian, they probably should there at Last Manor. What have you heard? <laughs> it's just like that whipped puppy. What, what have you heard? Have people been telling on me? No, they said just at, at your house they pray after they eat. That's all they said. <laughs> but anyway, oh, I tell you, you know, I went to eat at Brian Last's house one time, folks. He left dental floss on the table. The roaches hung themselves. The flies chipped in to fix the hole in the kitchen screen door. Anyway, again, omahasteaks.com, keyword JCE, 59% off, and four free New York strip burgers on the Get Out and Grill assortment. Boy, howdy, what a deal. Well, Jim, we briefly mentioned it before. Let's talk about Dark Side of the Ring, the finale of part one, or I guess the first half of season first half three. First half of season three. First half of season three. That's that's the way we're going to say it. And the big episode focusing on the Dynamite Kid, a wrestler who you were a big fan of before you got into the business. Oh, my God. Well, and here's the thing is that we see so much of this Falderall now, but it wasn't done in wrestling 
basically because nobody could do it and pull it off believably, the kind of shit that that Dynamite Kid started doing with Sayama, the Satura Sayama, the original Tiger Mask. In those matches, just as people were starting to get VHS machines. And at that time, in the United States, there were no main event matches broadcast on television. It was all studio shows or even the the companies that had gone to arena tapings like Crockett about 80, 81 with the Nemo truck and, and when World Class moved in the Sportatorium, blah, blah, blah. You weren't seeing main event competitive matches. So the Japanese tapes were already a hit with the huge a huge hit rather with the underground you know wrestling fans here in this country that were already kind of with the business and tape collecting and program collecting and etc so when you saw that yeah you know if if you watched 70s lucha in mexico you would see flying like that but there was nowhere near the level of of appearance of struggle with the lucha stuff it was just all pretty acrobatics and there was not necessarily, and, and in Lucha in the old days, they did some mat wrestling, but we've talked about the Lucha style evolved with the rolling bumps and the thing because those boxing rings in Mexico were harder than Chinese arithmetic and you just couldn't take bumps on them. And then you saw with some guys in the United States like Billy Robinson, Tony Charles, Les Thornton, Ted Heath, the British influence with the world of sports style, the ground-based mat wrestling, you never saw all of that put together in such a way as you still didn't lose the effect of a contest and it didn't look like obvious cooperation, but it, there was wrestling, there were high spots, there was lucha, there was flying, there was everything. And these guys were just two of the most amazing physical specimens in wrestling to be able to do it. That's what and I think Edge said, you know, the young guys that wanted to be wrestlers, they watched these tapes and it looked like they were on speed search. It wasn't necessarily even what they were doing, but the precision and the perfection and the speed. And at the same time, looking like the other guy was trying to stop them from doing it instead of cooperating with them to do it. So... It was the right pairing of the right guys at the right time. The only reason it happened is because they had a lot of money invested in Tiger Mask. Inoki's company did, New Japan. They had found him as a as a young boy, and, and they thought he was a prodigy, so they sent him to England to learn World of Sport. They sent him to Mexico to learn Lucha, and he worked all around the world, and then he came back, and they put the Tiger Mask gimmick on him because that was a huge cartoon character at the time in a comic book. And they figured it would just be for the kids, but they had to have smaller guys that could fly to work with him. So they started bringing in the luchas and they started bringing, and then they, they hit with dynamite, a young British kid, you know, well-versed in world of sport that I'm sure Sammy Lee and dynamite had probably wrestled in, in England. And that was what made the magic. So that's what got both of those guys. Tiger mask was going to get the big push anyway, but when, when they found Dynamite, that was the perfect opponent. And what did they run with that for two, two and a half years until basically finally the Bulldogs went to the WWF well, no, and couldn't no. come back? Or? No, they ran with that until Sayama quit New Japan. That's right. He quit first. He quit he New quit Japan first. and he went to form the UWF with Akira Maeda and Shinma and everyone else. And then eventually in 84, Davey Boy and Dynamite I believe shortly after Stu sold Stampede, they made the deal, which was pretty significant. Got major coverage, yeah. They jumped to All Japan. So now you had the British Bulldogs in All Japan, and then they quit Vince. So they were just doing All Japan, and that's when Vince had to go over there and work on a deal to get the Bulldogs back. And the front page of all the weekly magazines was Vince and Baba shaking hands, which infuriated Anoki who was paying, what, a million dollars for the rights to use Vince's talent. Right. And here's Vince and Baba shaking hands on the cover <laughs> of every magazine over the Bulldogs. But that's uh, they were a commodity, and, and it was, again, because of Dynamite specifically. But anyway, you know, you put the guy over, the performer over, everybody has always talked about and had stories about that he could be a miserable 
prick as well outside the ring. But there was a lot of guys here that they had an all-star cast. Jacques Rougeau, Danny Spivey, Mick Foley, Lance Storm, who's a tremendous resource. Um, Scott McGee, who you haven't seen or heard of in 30 years. He and was a tremendous resource. He was one resource. of his best friends. He was tremendous. Yeah. He was really legitimate and and honest. Um, but it, then it's not as as simple as it seems to say that, well, Dynamite was a prick outside the ring, but was a great talent in it, because apparently he was a great guy outside the ring, too, in some instances, until the substances, and who knows whether it was concussions. We didn't, there was no CTE back then, so nobody was looking for any symptoms. How many concussions would Dynamite Kid had to have had? Dozens? He was um, doing that headbutt off the top. He did it, didn't he do it once in Portland from the top rope to the floor? Yeah. Diving headbutt? Yeah, and, and and again, that's another story I've told with Danny Davis and Ken Wayne wrestled Calgary, came back to Memphis, said, yeah, there's this guy, Dynamite Kid, he's a British kid from England. Uh, He'll, you know, he'll stand tiptoe on the top of a ladder, they'll push the ladder over, he'll come off the top of the ladder, bounce off the top rope and fly over to the fucking floor in one motion. He's amazing, it's incredible. He's probably going to end up in a wheelchair. I swear to God, I heard that in 1980. So... You know, who knows what, what, do, just like with Benoit, just like with anybody, you know, that does these things later on in their life. It Was it concussions? Was it drugs? Was it steroids? Was it, here's the only thing that, and we'll talk more about this show, but I'll talk about for a second what it didn't have. And I think this was just timing, 45 minutes without commercials, but they started the show with him as a wrestler in Calgary, as a fully formed adult in the wrestling business. Nothing about his childhood. And we've read the book, Pure Dynamite. He was poor in England, grew up dirt poor, struggling, an undersized kid, became a professional wrestler in the 70s when he was 15 years old or whatever. Got shit kicked out of him because he was big around as a goddamn drinking straw but had that determination and overcame all that shit and finally got a chance. Remember the, the story's been told when, what, what was it? Ross, Ross Hart, or was it Bruce? Either one told Stu, Hey, we've seen this kid in England and we got to bring him. He's I the greatest Bruce. wrestler in the world. It was Bruce. It was Bruce. And Stu's like, okay, trust his sons. And then, here shows up and, and, and it was and same thing with Davey. What a year later or whatever, here shows this emaciated kid. That's, you know, that big around and they're what the fuck. And he's no, oh, this guy's going to change the business. And it, that's where Calgary got ahead of the rest of the North American continent with really hard hitting, more technical, faster paced stuff, as well as the wrestling Gaga, because, it was the the style that a lot of those guys could do, and it fit just like the Von Erichs determined the style in Texas, what the Hart family and or their various marital relations could do determined the style there. And so that's where they picked it up. But that's the drawback is that you didn't because, I mean, a lot of the shit in Dynamite Kid's childhood could have made him the person he was for good or bad as well and we didn't hear any of that so i know it's time limitations but holy shit it, it, you you started in the middle there i missed the first part of it um danny spivey looks 80 years old these days doesn't he how about that vein sticking out of the side of his head yeah <laughs> well anyway um <laughs> was it me uh, the, the, the one thing that they glossed over also and didn't even go back and show a replay of right before they talk about, you know, well, they went into dynamite being a prick. Like when he dislocated cactus's jaw, the first time he touched him in that job match in, in the WWF. And when they halcyoned poor old Mitch snow and shaved his head and his eyebrows and shit in his bag. And I remember Mitch snow from the Carolinas. He was a nice young kid, but, he didn't need to be consuming alcohol or anything, drinking or being anywhere near the British Bulldogs. Um, but they glossed over 
the sacrifice bump at WrestleMania 2. And didn't even really mention it. And then they go to where his back snapped in Hamilton that year. But the WrestleMania 2 sacrifice bump is what started that, right? I don't know for sure. And for the record, WWE's cameramen missed that sacrifice bump because you see Dynamite get hit and go flying off frame. But you could have gone back and said, watch Dynamite and put the lighted circle on it and played it in slow motion. For those of you who are completely going, what the fuck are you talking about? The finish of the WrestleMania 2 match so that the Bulldogs could win the belts was the old Anderson Brothers sacrifice where Davey Boy ran... Whose head was it? Uh, Maybe Valentine? Was it Valentine? Okay, ran Valentine's head into Dynamite's head. Like, you know, Arn, or Arn, Ole used to haul off and grab a baby face and run the baby face head, baby face's head into Gene's head. And it was a sacrifice. I'm sacrificing my brother to win the fucking match. But when Dynamite took it, he was standing up on the second rope, leaning over the top rope, And when the heads bonked, he just went backwards and took a nesty plunge, not off the apron, but off the second rope, flat of his back to the floor. Because it was WrestleMania, and he was Dynamite Kid, and that's the kind of thing he did on big shows. The cameraman missed it. Uh, Apparently, Dynamite just thought, well, it's TV, they'll shoot it, you know, or whatever. But So you barely saw it, but I had heard at the time that that's what started giving him serious, not that he wouldn't have had back trouble anyway from everything else he'd done, but that was a serious deal. And then they showed the footage, the VHS tape of the house show footage from somebody who had a camcorder where he was going into the heat spot. He hits the ropes. Heel drops down. He's going to hit the ropes on the, in front of the heel partner and the heel partner is going to give him a knee in the back But when the guy did the drop down and he jumped over him, they didn't make this clear, but this is what happened. When he jumped over the guy, he felt his back snap and he tried to stay up and make it to the ropes. And you can see him turn and the the heel went with a knee and didn't even really hit him, but he just crumpled in pain because his back had snapped from jumping over the guy doing the drop down. It just, it was Morocco, wasn't it? Morocco. It was just the straw that broke the camel's back. It was something that anybody would do. It's like when, you know, Nash got in the ring that time and fucking took two steps and tore his quad. It was just time for it to go. It wasn't anything that you would have thought, but that's what put him out. And then they removed the discs after the surgery. And then it was a big story in wrestling at the time, not in, well, I don't know. I get the smart fans knew about it, but we all knew in the locker room when they fucking basically brought him back and had Davey help him to the ring so that he could stand there and they turn the cameras on and Jimmy Hart nails him with the megaphone and he's down on the floor and Davey gets beat. Uh, So they get the belts off of him and then they carried Dynamite back out and he went back home and got back in a wheelchair. But that was, in those days, not only was that the dedication that guys showed to dropping a belt or to putting another guy over and get, you know, not fucking up the booking, but also the promoters didn't think anything of that in those days and publicly traded company or no, I've had situations where guys have been hurt and offered to do something. I said, no, we can do it another way. I don't even know if I as hard hearted as I am would have done that one and said, no, let's get you out to the ring. Some kind of fucking way carry you. But so a lot of guys in in wrestling knew about that at the time, and they knew he was pretty much fucked from that point. Even though he came back, it was never the same, and that's where he started having the... There had always been stiff ribs, and there had always been, you know, he was that hard kind of guy, but then all the issues happened in, what, the year or less that he was back after the surgery and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, he... Dropped the titles. They had him back at WrestleMania 3, which was still too early for him to be back, but they were able to hide some of his weaknesses. It was a six-man match. And then it was really 88 that everything fell apart. 
And now help me on this since you are a wrestling savant because Jacques Rougeau, I loved yeah. He's a French Canadian, right? We've talked about the the love the French Canadians. We love them. But he even says, you know, I was kind of I had a little bit of arrogance. You know, maybe I'd like to like to joke. People take it the wrong way. Um but the instigation for the whole thing with Dynamite and or the Bulldogs and the Rougeaus, but specifically Dynamite and Jacques, was Henning's rib, right? With the clothes? That's right. And they, they didn't mention that. But wasn't it Kurt had taken a razor blade in the locker room, which they used to do, and zipped up Davy or, Bull, or, or Dynamite's suit jacket or something? I forget what he did, but the story I had always heard was Kurt Hennig, who was known as a big ribber, who had just yeah. gotten there a little while before this to the WWF, Pulled a rib on Dynamite, made it look like it was Jock, and then Dynamite reacted the way he did, which was to... Well, yeah, I actually, I don't even know if he made it look like it was Jock or just led them to believe that after the fact. I remember it was something, was zipping the suit with the razor blade. Because what you do is you take a fucking... Well, the guy's in a ring, his jacket's hanging there. You take the razor blade and you cut it, zip it. Where When the guy puts the jacket, you can't tell when it's hanging there, but when he puts it on, it's fucking hanging in goddamn ribbons right and then the natural thing especially if dynamite got hot about it visually hot and not in a good ribbing way but the natural thing was whoever it seemed like it would be let's fucking put the attention to them so if already Jacques and dynamite had been making little comments then all hennig had to do was go well, boy that's it's an awful long way for that guy to go, even if he said some of those things. And then you planted it. How do you know it's him? Why well, don't I just figure it? And then you just go on. And then it starts fucking festering. So then the way Jacques told it, he was told to come in the locker room and sit down and play cards. I heard that Davey just fucking walked up without any warning and just fucking dynamite or dynamite rather walked up without any warning and just fucking whacked him. And he didn't know it was either way. He didn't know it was coming and he got shit kicked at him. Um, so then that's where the roll of quarters came. I'm glad that Jacques senior got the credit for that. That used to be a great angle too. uh, the roll of quarters and you leave the end open so that when you throw the punch, it'll fly out the fucking tube and everybody sees the quarters. But anyway, um, so yeah, four teeth down he went, fucked him up. Well, no, and he actually, in truth, he never went down. The story always was that that was one of the stories he got. He went hit. down to pick his teeth up. <laughs> I don't know. He went. He got hit. He was bleeding. His teeth went out. But the story was always that he didn't leave his feet. That he didn't get well, knocked down. You may have me there. Uh, but anyway, a lot of people got in the middle of all that stuff. But um. That's basically, they had to do something. They couldn't have both those teams in the same locker rooms. And what was they, they left both of them off for a little while, but the, was it that they couldn't get dynamite to say that he wasn't going to try to kill Jacques or how did it in, end up that they eventually fucking fired the Bulldogs or the Bulldogs just left? Well, no, the Bulldogs quit. Uh, really, at Dynamite's request, they quit. Davey, I think, wanted to stay. Davey didn't want to go, and Davey ended up going back a year and a half, two years later. But what happened was, after the incident, Vince brought them all together, I believe, because they were about to work on opposite sides of a Survivor Series tag team match, where it's like yeah. five, five teams on each side. So they had to have the sit-down so there wouldn't be any goddamn bloodshed on television. And there wasn't. They worked together that night, and that was the last night the British Bulldogs worked for the WWF as a tag team. And then they went back to Calgary, where Dynamite was going to be the booker, and they were going to do Dynamite versus Davey, and they did. One of the problems was Ed Wayland didn't really want to see that feud, so a lot of it didn't <laughs> air on TV, which... <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but that's literally the, the, what happened. The TV announcer, because he had the one, he was a big shot and had gotten him hooked up with the TV. He could take shit off TV if he didn't like it. So in the latter years, it fucked up a lot of their best angles. But that's what happened. Dynamite left the WWF. That was the last time fans ever saw him on a mainstream level in the United States. He worked in Calgary. He went back to work for Baba with Johnny Smith. 
And then he retired a few years later. He had that comeback. They had the footage. I still have the uh, commercial video from 96, that Michinoku Pro uh, six-man tag match. Well, hey, hold on. Before we get there, there's one piece of information here that I loved that I'd never heard before. And I loved Jacques' reaction to it. Where they said that Dino Bravo had warned the Dynamite Kids family he had warned the kid through the family not to fuck with Jacques Rougeau am I saying that properly because Dino Bravo everybody knew as to what happened later on with him he was hooked up with the shady people in Quebec the uh, I don't know what they call the mafia in Canada um but the warning I'd never heard that story before and then Jacques claimed it was a stooge test which is great and something that Jacques would do because the story that the that the kids family got was was hey this well-known mobster in Quebec will kill you if anything happens to Jacques Rougeau and so they although, were all like, what the fuck right although, although the one thing with Jacques story with it being a stooge test there's a little bit of a difference between them thinking Dino Bravo's relaying information from Jock to what Dynamite's ex-wife said, which was Dino was the one threatening us. It was going to be Dino doing it. That's where maybe Jock doesn't want to admit that. Yeah, we knew who <laughs> Dino's friends were and we were going to take <laughs> advantage of it. Well, but, but here's the Dino may have been the one delaying the information to them. But I thought it was, it, I can see this happening because I've done this to a couple of people and w we've talked about a few of them, including Mr. Terry Taylor, who flunked the stooge. Everybody flunks the stooge test. If you have to give somebody a stooge test, they're going to flunk it. But I love the way Jacques said, I just wrote a name down on a piece of paper. I said, see, I need to call this guy every night. If I don't call him, something's going to happen. And he can write down fucking Jimmy Hoffa or... Al Capone or any name he wanted to write, as long as they're all Canadian, they'd all recognize the name. I can see that happening. I liked it anyway. Um, but then they went to his, his home life was chaos. His wife was unhappy. The big fight happens when she gives him a, basically a plane ticket to England says, go back and leave us be this is, this can't work. And then that's when he got the shotgun and pointed it at her head in front of the kids and he, whatever the fuck. And can you just, can you imagine what he must have been going through? Because if you go back to England, you've got two kids and another one on the way in Calgary. And you never straighten yourself out up, straighten yourself up or out or whatever well enough to ever go back. He never went back to Canada again. And that, you know... <sighs> And like you said, then they, they had the footage of that comeback in 96. He was skeletal. It it was pale. It didn't look like the same person. I would have to think that just... They were trading off of... Michinoku Pro was a one of the early outlaw companies in Japan, and they were small time. Well, no, this was a big show because what they did was it was a six-man match. And again, I, I yeah. don't have it in front of me, but I believe it was... Dynamite, Kuniaki Kobayashi. Yeah. And I forget who the third Kid person Kobe was. Kid Kobe is who, what his nickname was. Against the original Tiger Mask Sayama, the great Sasuke, and I want to say Mil Moscaris. I think it was. But I can't remember um, who the third opponent was right now. But that's, that's what I was about to say before you so rudely interrupted me. They were a small-time independent outlaw promotion in Japan, but all of a sudden they put together this fucking generational dream match with all these fucking guys that have been major stars at different points in different places in Japan. But do you think they had known what Dynamite Kid looked like when they booked that? Or what do you think they thought when when that skeletal apparition showed up instead of dynamite kid i was pretty regularly getting the japanese magazines around that period of time and i was pretty informed and maybe there's something i don't remember but i don't remember too many photos around that period of time before that appearance popping up about dynamite kid or for no dynamite because kid. i remember seeing the tape and the first thing i thought was oh fuck he's gonna die soon it just it wasn't the same human being 
Um, you know, it's funny. Real so quick, that, that was sad. Real quick, this just came to me. I remember my disappointment as a thirteen-year-old when I'd read about Michinoku Pro in the Observer, and he would describe it as the Smoky Mountain Wrestling of Japan. Oh God! I didn't realize that meant that it's a regional promotion. <laughs> I thought it meant like, wow, they're doing angles and interviews and all this stuff on TV. <laughs> And, you know, you get the tapes, and I was enjoying some of that stuff. I liked uh, a lot of those guys at the time, but there were no angles and promos. But when I read it was the Smoky Mountain Wrestling of Japan, that's what I thought. Can Uncle Dave please start looking at the camera? <laughs> please. He, I mean, he's he's good. He has background on all this stuff. He was around. He, he This is before he had lost his mind about wrestling, so he has good takes on these things. But please, he looks like he's being grilled as a, a fucking potential perp in a goddamn criminal investigation. Look at the camera. His eyes are always darting around every one of these things. I did notice that as well. Darting around, back and forth. Shifty, shifty. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, yeah, then the finally, you know, uh, they mentioned Michelle, his ex-wife mentioned that during the Benoit era that she finally spoke out about some of the things that had gone on between them and that the kids had found out. And then that's kind of sad because one daughter went to visit Bronwyn, went to visit him in England. The other one didn't want to. So it, he finally apologized to her there. But, you know, still, that's kind of a fucked up situation for everybody involved. And and then he was in the wheelchair for, what, not long after probably the Michinoku come back until... How long has it been there? What was it? 20? When did he pass away? Not that long ago. A few years back, right? So it was, it, yeah, it was quite a while that he would just, yeah. Remember there was a video that popped up. I don't know if you saw it. Maybe a year, year and a half before he died. It was him and Sayama on a video chat. And the original Tiger Mask was so excited. He's like, hello, Tommy. You know, and they're, they're talking to each other. Dynamite could barely move. Like, yeah. he was barely twitching. Like, there was nothing happening. And it was the saddest thing ever. So anyway, that is the close of part one of season three of Dark Side of the Ring. And there's going to be some good stuff coming up, including uh, the episode at the second scene. We'll try to have dates and information on this as it as it becomes made available. But Bruiser Bedlam. Johnny K-9 is one episode. They're going to do the steroid trial, and they have interviewed Jerry McDivitt. This will be interesting. Uh, and uh, several others we're going to be interested in. But um, but boy, oh boy. Uh, isn't it funny also how many dramatic and or dark sides of the ring coincide with the people involved in Calgary, the Hart family, Montreal, et cetera, that whole periphery there. That's and Texas. a variety. And well, Texas was, but I think if, there's more intersection here now in Calgary and Montreal and the screw job than there is from the Von Erich tragedy. How about Vince in the uh, Brett documentary? As he, what, what did he say? As he calls it the screw job. Like, you know, he wouldn't even admit yeah. <laughs> what it was. Well, also because Vince had never heard that terminology before either. Uh, there was no such word, as I've said many times, in wrestling, inside wrestling, as screw job. It was a fuck finish. Screw him if you're, you know, more prudish or there's somebody around you don't want to hear you cursing. But that was a double cross, what he did. So he says he calls it the screw job because that was instantly... Brett said he got screwed and the fans that wrote the, the sheets at the time had come up with a terminology of screw job finish. So that became the Montreal screw job. But actually Vince would theoretically say it like that because it's not a real wrestling term that you would have used in those days. Just a clarification. All right. Oh, but you know what? You know what, Brian? I can't help but think that if people could just be in better moods and be happier, that some of this stuff wouldn't happen. And I can't think of a happier thing to do than retreat into yourself in your own world 
not have the hustle and bustle of city life around you, not have people nattering at you all the time, annoying you, being able to listen to what you want to listen to and either learn or listen to music and be entertained or be uplifted by a positive podcast like ours where we constantly want people to reach for the stars. And the only way you can do that really by shutting out the outside world and listening to what you want is getting a pair of the Raycon wireless earbuds. That's going to make all the difference, folks, because whether you're working out or you're taking a trip or you're just spending time outdoors walking the dog or petting the cat or chasing the mice or whatever you may be doing work or play if you're on the move take your raycons with you a pair of raycon wireless earbuds in your ears gives you crisp powerful beats as the kids say at half the price of the other premium audio brands they look great they feel even better come in a range of cool colors they'll they'll pair up with your blue teeth, see a dentist if they get too blue, but they'll pair up with your blue teeth. They have 24 hours of battery life on a charge. They're portable. You can stick them right in your pocket or wherever you hold things that you hold dear. And right now, Raycon is offering 15% off all of their products for our listeners right here only. And here's what you got to do. Go to buyraycon.com, B-U-Y. R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash J-C-E. That sounds violent. There, you're going to get 15% off your entire Raycon order. Not just one set of earbuds. Not just two, but your entire order. You'll grab a pair and a spare and maybe even some more after that. 15% off at buyraycon.com slash J-C-E. All right. All righty. What are you doing this week on your various programming? Another action-packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all shows on Twitter, at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. And don't forget to check out kfabememories.com and, of course, the Kfabe Memories Classic Wrestling Forum. A few notes, John. Another wrestling history mystery. John? What the fuck? John, are you familiar with, with me? How long have we known each other now? God damn it. <laughs> Say, have we met? My name's Jim, Brian. How about you? Another action-packed week, Jim. This week, another wrestling history mystery is... <laughs> Applause there. You got my name right. Another wrestling history mystery is looked at by Al Getz. Go to chartingthepodcast.com or look for Charting the Territories, wherever you find your favorite podcast, as Al Getz takes a look at Eddie Sullivan and tries to answer a mystery about Eddie Sullivan. Check that out. Another wrestling history mystery from Charting the Territories. Also want to make mention of Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam, a very special guest this week. The king of recovery himself, Jim Valley, returns to Arcadian Vanguard with an appearance on Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam, talking about 30 years ago, Ric Flair leaving the WWF, excuse me, leaving WCW for the WWF. Check that out today at McAdamPod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcast, Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam. Jim, I want to tell you about John's show. John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight. Is that John Arezzi? I've met him. John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight, of course. Not only have you met him, you've appeared on his show. Yes, and I this have. week, the show we review from 30 years ago, the 100th episode of Pro Wrestling Spotlight. John has so many guests, including Cactus Jack in studio, Kevin Sullivan, Woman, and of course, some guests right here that we're about to hear from. Let's hear a moment of this, Jim. On the line is Joel Goodhart, promoter from the TWA. Yeah, oh boy. And he's about to promote a show, Spring Spectacular 2. You're on the line. And also the man who will be wrestling Dick Murdoch on that show, Terry Funk. So let's hear from John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight, March 17th, 1991. Joel Goodhart, Terry Funk, and Jim Cornette. 
matches that I'm really looking forward to seeing is a barbed wire match. Uh, last card we had a barbed wire match with two of our local guys. This time the guy that's coming up to your studio, Cactus Jack, will be involved in a barbed wire match as he keeps his feud going with Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a great one. And whose phone is ringing over there? That's my phone. That's your phone is always ringing there, Goodhart. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you know, it's <laughs> constantly busy, but Spring Spectacular 2 tickets went on sale yesterday, and hopefully those people calling in are calling with orders. And, of course, uh, one well, I didn't of the know the IRS worked on Sunday. There you go. One of the main events uh, <laughs> we talked about before that I'm calling Texas Trouble, but might be for the Me Self World Organization title, Terrible Terry Funk taking on Dirty Dick Murdoch. So just to capsulize a little Let bit. Let me ask you something. What kind of rules and regulations do you have on our match? Last time you had 12 nuts, 12 <laughs> fools running around the ring trying to throw me back into the ring. 12 morons that didn't have any ability. Now, what are you going to try to do to me this time, Goodhart? Well, I think... What I... kind of rules and regulations do you want? Uh, I don't have anything... Why don't you let me make the rules and regulations? Uh, in fact, I'll go... What with kind that. of rules and regulations do you want? I'd like the old... I, you want know rule I would like to have? There's no rules. How would that be? No rules. How about a Texas death match? Falls don't count. No stopping because of blood. You can't have a count outside of the ring. It goes till one of us gets up to our feet, and the other one can't go on anymore. Why don't you have something like that up there? I'll tell you that what would I'll be something you. good with me and Murdoch, wouldn't it? I'll tell you wouldn't what. you like to see that? I'd love to see it personally. Would you like to see it or not, John? Y yes, indeed, Terry. How about you, Cornette? I think it would be the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. It would be the greatest thing that you've ever seen because I'd just beat the hell out of Murdoch. <laughs> he well, needs it too. I'll tell you what I'm. You going couldn't to do. beat any sense out of him, no, could you, Cornell? <laughs> It'd take you all day to beat the manure out of him, so you might as well try to beat sense out of him. That would take but just a couple of minutes. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going. To do. I try to be very fair. I will contact Dick Murdoch's agents and attorneys, and if they're willing to sign the match, as you state, with no rules, Texas death match rules, then we'll do the match. Okay. Fair along. You're having all of those calls, good heart. He's getting all those Cornette, the people just found out down there that Cornette's going to be on your card, and I'm going to be on your card. And it's all those people calling for reservations. That's exactly what it is. They want those great tickets. We want a raise. Let me we want a raise. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, Terry. <laughs> yes, sir. Would you like to handle my business affairs from now on? <laughs> well, I'd like to handle your business affairs, but we should be handling this show. That's it true. It should be our 100th show. Hey, this is my 100th show, guys. Hey, John, did you ever yeah. feel as though you lost control? Yeah, sometimes you feel that way, right, but... Well, let, uh, me, let me get off the air because of all these... We're going to join your booster club, me and Cornette both. Well, you can hear more action like that on John Arezzi's Pro way, Wrestling Joe Spotlight. Goodhart, <laughs> Joe Goodhart was another example of a promoter that was giving the people the matches they want to see. He was signing dream matches that wrestling fans in Philadelphia had never seen. The Sheik versus Abdullah the Butcher. Fucking Terry Funk and Dick Murdoch, as as they just said. All these, re the Terry Funk, or I'm sorry, the Eddie Gilbert and Cactus Jack two out of three matches uh, incident that one night. Well, the previous they show. Had two out of three matches. The previous show was Lawler versus Funk with fans as lumberjacks. Yes, yes. And one time he booked me and Stan Lane as the Midnight Express to wrestle the Fantastics, Bobby and Jackie Fulton. Uh, cause that was a, dr everything was a dream match with him. And he flew these guys in from all over the country and put these matches together and did huge crowds at that. What was the name of the building he was at? It wasn't the civic center that Crockett ran, but it would hold what four or 5,000 people probably close to that. And he was drawn in <laughs> and on after his biggest card ever and his biggest gate ever. That's, that's when he went underground cause he went out of business and he owed everybody money. So the moral to that story is. You are a Mark promoter that wants to sign all the dream matches that all the other fans want to see. And because you go to any price to do it, you're selling the shows out and you still go broke and go out of business. That's what happens when you book all the dream matches that the people want to see and don't have a fucking clue about how to conduct your goddamn business or keep your payroll in check. Go ahead. Well, you can hear more from all these characters, Joel Goodhart, <laughs> Jim Cornette, Terry Funk, Kevin Sullivan, Woman, and so much more. Look for John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now wherever you find your favorite podcast. Don't forget, pwspod.com, and hear the original broadcast, the entire uncut original broadcast with commercials and everything, patreon.com slash Arezzi. But of course, the 605 Super Podcast. The membership! Hee-haw!
Go through the archive today at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts, The Mothership. The Mothership. The Mothership. All right, let's go to a different kind of mothers now. Um, They're quitting pretty much throwing in the towel and giving up while they're on Friday nights. So this is not going to be as detailed because honestly, I was zoning out. And I've mentioned before earlier in the program, we talk about AEW merely because so many hundreds of thousands of the listeners have asked us to, because that's the only way they can get enjoyment out of it. But I'll tell you what, it's killing me. Um, as and soon this, as I saw the opening match this week, I said they've given up on Friday nights. They've given up on, <laughs> we've given up on Friday night. Uh, and and I guess they saw the ratings the last couple of weeks because we had thought when they go to Friday night temporarily, it's still it's ten o'clock on Friday night. It's not like it's two o'clock on Sunday morning. If you'll watch this horse shit on Wednesday night at eight o'clock, one would think you'd watch it on Friday night at ten. And we thought that they'd keep around seven hundred thousand or so of their devotees but it, they dropped to 586,000 okay well i guess that would be friday night at 10 o'clock time change but now the people will get used to it well last week they were down below 500 right i think so so i think it was at the high four so now they just say well fuck it so we're gonna fill this programming but goddamn, it's still television any tv you get that you are lucky enough to be able to produce an air should have a point to it. It should be something. I mean, we used to do throwaway shows on the holidays in OVW when we wouldn't want to fucking work, me and Danny Davis, our goddamn Christmas and our New Year, whatever. And so we would put together highlights and great matches of the year, and I'd do wraparounds. And that was kind of a, th but it was Christmas and New Year's, right? It wasn't going to be the end of the world. But this is still national television. I don't know whether they've thrown the towel in because they don't know how to do it right anyway, because you can't tell by their regularly scheduled program that they have any clue how to get this shit across or whether now it's just gotten worse or more blase or whatever. But they open a national television program with Christian Cage against Angelico. I guess they didn't want to risk using Jack Evans against a valuable talent just in case he hurt him. Um, and of course there's the Hardy promo where, okay, let's assume not by the way he's portrayed, but let's just assume that Matt Hardy, because of his name value is a top manager in AEW. So the top manager trying to get a job guy to stop or embarrass or defeat or roadblock or whatever, put a stumbling block in front of the path of a star that can work if it goes somewhere. It doesn't go too long, and it's 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 leading to something. But here, they just had Hardy do a promo with Angelico and Evans, and they're obviously job guys, and nothing happened to change that, and it went way too long. Um, At least Angelico's a heel, but that squirmy, awkward, bullshit work style that he's got is annoying, and... I would have thought he'd have made more money at his previous job as a medical school skeleton. If he gets sunburned, he looks like a thermometer. He turns sideways, sticks his tongue out, he looks like a zipper. He uses a Cheerio for a hula hoop. He forgot the key to his house one time. He slipped in through the mail slot. His shadow weighs three pounds more than he does. Okay, I could go okay, on. Okay, okay. <laughs> but anyway, um, you didn't even bring up his dancing. Is that what it is? Matt Hardy's doing his promo. I There's no he was music. Having a convulsion. I thought that he was off his medication <laughs> and his palsy had come back. Anyway, Cage did the best he could. This was too long and way too competitive. This guy's a job guy, and I don't care. Maybe his mother likes him. Maybe he has fans somewhere. Has he ever won a match on this television program? No. Fuck. It's a job guy. It was too long and too competitive, but finally Christian Cage hit his finish. Boom, one, two, three, fine. Afterbirth. Did you, here comes Jack Evans. And did you see as soon as Cage threw a punch, Evans is so awkward and doesn't have any idea of how to work with what he's given 
So he took one punch. He takes this bump as Cage and Christian is trying to fucking keep his hands on him. And Christian tries to bring him up and rough him up to keep his back turned for a second so he can turn around and get glommed. He nails him again. Evans took three times to finally be able to take a backwards bump over the top rope. The bump did not suit anything that Christian Cage had done to him. It's just the bump that he determined before this whole thing started that he was going to take. Because that's what these guys do. So, oh, you just kicked me in the shin. I better fly over the top rope. Anyway, after birth, Jack Awkward, that's his new name, Jack Awkward, uh, takes a bump over the top rope. Matt Hardy then, as Christian Cage turns, hits the twist of fate on him. They get a little heat, and here comes Jungle Boy and makes save. Which, you know, if if this wasn't their formula for every single fucking match, might be more interesting. Any thoughts on this before we move on? I was already tired, but I was like, okay, let's see what they do. Let's see how they're going to start. I wondered how they would react to the ratings because week one, I think, surprised them. Week two had to be concerning. Remember, they're going to go back to Wednesdays. They're, they are going to be having a Friday night show. So this is saying a lot yeah, about Yeah, this is their new regular time slot. Yeah for their new show so so let's tank it on purpose but as soon as i saw this because again we've had the christian cage what kazarian match and then we had christian against who was the other one that it, it was just like why am i watching this for so long i knew what this match would be i'm happy it didn't go 20 minutes and i'm really unexcited about a matt hardy christian feud And the, the the Christian and Kazarian match was professionally done between two experienced pros. It's just that they were both nominally baby faces and didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but they can't find a six foot tall, 220 pound athletic heel that can work, that can do a job for Christian Cage in eight minutes. I, I, it shouldn't be that difficult. It really shouldn't. Anyway, the next interview segment was the Bill Watts memorial segment where he would have fined... Uh, uh, <laughs> God damn it. God damn it. Tony Schiavone in the ring. He brings out Cody. He brings out Arn and Brock Anderson, Arn's son. The first time we've seen the next in line of the storied Anderson family. And nobody, nobody thought to have him dress like he's somebody. Brock Anderson comes out in loafers with no socks, white shorts, and a polo shirt. He's not Mr. Universe. I'm sure he's a good athlete, but he doesn't look impressive physically. So put him in some clothes that do. Here's a goddamn guy that's carrying on the legacy of the Anderson family name, the son of Arn Anderson, the enforcer. He's going to be interacting with Cody Rhodes, one of the top stars in this promotion, and he walks out there like a fucking guy that lost his goddamn fanny pack outside of TGI Fridays on a Thursday afternoon about 4.30. So Watts would have fined Brock Anderson for dressing like that on television. Um, Cody spoke for 30 seconds, and now comes QT and interrupted on the microphone, cut a promo <laughs> on Cody. It's every Cody promo. And challenged Cody for a South Beach strap match. Because they're going to be in Miami or thereabouts, those environs, some suburb. What is a South Beach strap match? Brian? You know what a strap match is, right? I know what a strap match is, but I didn't know they had them in South Beach. Is that where all the, the fucking strippers in goddamn bikinis and the fucking drug dealers from Columbia with a lot of gold jewelry? Is that where they strap each other up to themselves and fucking fling each other in the ocean? What's going on with a South Beach you strap know, match? I don't think the hookers and the drug dealers do that, uh, from the best of my knowledge. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's you, you have that strap match. You strap yourself to someone else so that you can't overeat and you lose weight. The South Beach strap match. It's a low carb thing, right? <laughs> you know, that may work. What is a South Beach strap match? It's a match we've never seen before. 
Okay. Something brand new. It's a strap match, but... In South Beach. It takes place in Miami. God damn it. It's too bad Dusty never thought of this years ago. If only Dusty, if only Wahoo had known, instead of an Indian <laughs> strap match, you know, that's what... Goddamn, every time you go down to South Beach, you see nothing but those goddamn, those, those Shawnees and those Cherokees and those Choctaws and Chickasaws. They're all over everywhere. South Beach is overrun with the Native Americans, or as they say in England, the Red Indians. So they're, they're having a strap match for no reason, but because it's in Miami, it's good. They're going to call it a South Beach strap match. Remember, they had a bull rope match between Dustin and... Was it Comorato or was it Solo or a go go? Comorato. Comorato. They had a, uh, a bull rope match where they used a deflated fire hose as the bull rope. So I wonder what the strap will be. Will that be a goddamn logging chain? So basically, after the challenge, QT and Cody start taking the belts off their pants. And Arn's trying to stop Cody, and QT whipped Arn once, and he... <sighs> Arn's wearing a fucking jacket, and still QT held up on it. And he had the... the. When you double up the strap, in other words, you see guys with a belt, they're going to whip a guy. Instead of whipping, holding on to the belt buckle and using the whole length of the belt to whip, you don't do that in a working way, because then the end of that belt can wrap around and catch you in the eye or whatever the fuck. And it doesn't make good noise unless you really get a good, smooth swing at a bare back. What you do is you double the belt. You have not only the buckle, but also the other end of it in your right hand, and it's doubled up. Then when you hit somebody on the back, not only if their back is bare does it smack, but also you get a much louder smack because the belt smacks together. So he tried to hit Arn with the belt doubled up, but it didn't make any noise whatsoever because Arn's wearing a shirt and a jacket. So it's not going to hurt, and it's not going to make any noise, but Arn sold it like he was going to the electric chair. So as soon as he whipped him, then Brock, Arn's son, double legs and tackles QT, and did you notice, I mentioned earlier in the program they're listening, Brian, when Brock... Anderson, the new wrestler that we've never actually seen in action, double legs QT Marshall and takes him down and starts throwing punches at his head. Every referee in the building was there instantly, throwing their bodies in the in between these two guys. In a fucking twinkle toes angle or an angle involving the Cucamonga kids, they're out there with chainsaws, plumbing implements sodomizing some guy with a goddamn uh, the pipe out of a septic tank, chainsawing their heads off, nobody comes out. But Cody, because he's the wrestling guy, he's got them out so quick they had to be just standing there waiting for it. Remember, we covered this on the show last week. They don't not come at all because then it's fake, but they don't all come in a clump either because then it's fake. The referee in the ring should be the first one. There was no referee because this was an interview. So a referee and a fucking production guy and then another couple of referees. And by the way, if you're going to do this for a schoolyard skirmish, then the next time that people are being mutilated on camera with sledgehammers, you might ought to send a few people out for that too. Because the biggest problem with this show is there's no consistency and it's left up to the intellect or lack thereof of whoever the fucking yokel is that's involved in the segment so then attempted murder like i said no assistance a teenage fucking golf caddy tackles qt marshall and there's chaos we can't let this go on and Did qt you notice sucks anything else on the mic it? qt sucks on the mic he ain't had a lot of practice no he's not very good this whole feud sucks nobody cares I'm not excited about Brock Anderson. We'll see what happens, but uh, everything with Cody sucks lately. I'm, ex I'm, you know, I'm excited to see Arn's son. I'd like to see it. Bryant Anderson, only son, was a goddamn pretty good professional wrestler as a rookie. And the only reason he didn't 
continue it is because he saw that there was no more territories and no place to go unless you want to deal with goddamn national companies. And he went and has been gainfully successfully employed since then and now is a big time attorney. But he was a good fucking wrestler for being a rookie. We'll see. This guy comes out of what? QT and Cody school, like everyone else QT and Cody work with. Hopefully Arn will pay more attention to him than than those other people. We'll see. Uh, then they had a trios tag team match. They've got to, <laughs> they can't even say six man tag match. They've got to do the Lucha terminology. I, at least there was one Lucha guy in here. Penthouse and Pac and Eddie Kingston against the Cucamonga kids and Brandon Cutlet. And Penthouse, of course, and Pac were heels last week. But as Kingston said, he's teaming with them because the enemies of my enemies are my friends. But the best thing about Penthouse is his interpreter, Alex. And now here we have no Alex. And I, by the way, I'm, I don't know. I might retire the Cucamonga kids because I, as reading my emails, I mentioned I've been going through a few weeks worth. Uh, there has been a campaign recently to call them the Hardly Boys because they do imitate Jeff and Matt as much as they imitate anybody else. and also. They always look from those looks on their faces like they have a raging clue. So they may be the Hardly Boys. Could you get a raging clue about that? Hardly Boy number one? Ooh, yes. I'm not crazy about the Hardly Boys. I like the Kukumaga yeah, I'm not kids. crazy about any of these fucking people. Uh, you, you don't watch South Park a lot, do you? Anyway. Um, they are, the, the Kukumaga kids then are now literally cosplaying every top heel wrestler ever because they come out it looks like a halloween costume advertisement where kids are dressed up as their favorite pro wrestlers but they don't really have the copyright on any pro wrestlers so they've just made generic costumes that look like pro wrestlers would wear uh i was actually during this match compiling my notes on the rest of this program i looked up at one point and they were doing comedy with cutlet um and then I didn't pay any attention for a lot longer. And then the uh, the kids double super kicked Cutlet by accident, but he went to a knee. His own partners, the, the tag team champions, double super kicked him by accident when the baby face ducks and he went to a knee. And then Penthouse ran at Balding Buck, who I guess now is that... He's changed his hair color. Is he setting it up for when he has to get fake implants that they can all be the same color? So you think that's what he's doing now or what? I don't know. I mean, now that he's a heel, he's grown the facial hair. He's dyed his hair darker. And I said it a few weeks ago that I commended him for the fact that although his brother hams it up and acts like such a goof, then no one could take him seriously. He's not a tough guy. Doesn't come across like much of a wrestler to a lot of people. He comes across like someone pretending i thought nick at least came across as genuine in what he was now he's hamming it up too so now you have two guys pretending to be heel wrestlers as they've always envisioned and they're so unoriginal they just basically have to copy whatever anyone else did i'm really not digging it i really hated this match we'll get into the rest of the match of the fucking referee uh, I'm sure in a moment the ham and eggers the ham and eggers hamming it up um but after that double super kick spot, well, here's what we won't get in the rest of the match because I didn't see any more because the very next thing that happened, Penthouse ran at Balding Buck and jumped up into his arms and Balding Buck caught him. And then they did the actual circus performer double thing where they, the one guy waist locks the other guy and the guy does a forward roll and they actually do, do forward rolls around the stage, right? Well, they did that. They both forward rolled, and then Penthouse jumped up and over Pie Face, Balding's brother, and gave him, a, gave, in quotation marks, him a Canadian destroyer out of that. And I said, fuck it, time is wasting. So I fast-forwarded to the finish. Pack somehow beat Cutlet, but it took a long time. And, and by the way, Cutlet is wearing a red tracksuit with that weird plexiglass facial shield in front of him i guess it looks like he's 
a salad bar at the Golden Corral. Um, so after he gets pinned, guess what they did after that? Afterbirth! So the Bucks are joined by Gallows and Anderson to get heat on Kingston and Penthouse. They did something to pack, and pack disappeared. And then Kazarian hits the ring for the save, and then the other heels leave, but they leave Cutlet in the ring so he can get beat up some more. So the baby faces win. Then the heels get some heat on them, but then the baby face makes a save, but then they leave the flunky heel in the ring long enough to beat him up and take the heat off the heels for what they just did. This was just a complete fucking abortion. Just a mess. And there was that. They're in the middle of the match. I just realized how much I hated this, and I've been more leaning to the Bucks than you. (laughs) <laughs> but I really don't like them now that they're so cartoony because I'm, I'm sick of that. And, you know, Omega and Callus are already cartoony. We don't need more of that. But then watching this match and like every Bucks match, they're not creative enough to put together their match and do their spots in the confines of rules. So like every Bucks match, at some point, it just devolves or De- yeah, I guess devolves would be the word. De- devolves, degenerates, devolves descends. into everyone in the ring, everyone out of the ring, everyone doing everything. The referee does nothing. We talk about this. That referee's garbage. He's only there because he's friends with these clowns. This week, I actually watched. They're all either on the floor or at the edge of the ring. The referee is in the corner, the far corner from them. It was like he was signing the match. The one guy gets super kicked. I watched the referee. He puts his hand on his head. He's signing what they're doing. I saw that once years ago when I was in England and I watched Raw and they had a guy like doing the moves at the bottom in sign language. Yes, they do that. They have sign language interpreters on the TV shows in England and they sign not only the statements, but also the actions. That's what that referee does. He literally does nothing. Why not just have the Bucks matches with no referee? Why oh, Brian, because that would be phony. So lazy. I, I'm just so sick of their style of match. <laughs> it's the same fucking thing every time. Let's do and a bunch of things. And then they do their babyface buck shit in the middle of acting like heels. Then they'll bust out a backflip into a fucking something that a babyface would do. The same thing they do in their babyface matches. And then they make mean faces after they do it. It just... It just... But anyway, we left Looney Tunes and went to Merry Melodies, which was highlights of Pockets and Olivier. And it was Saturday morning and Harley needed a bed rub, a bed rub, a belly rub in the bed there. And I didn't pay any attention to this. Um, then the Pinnacle. Remember that top heel group that looked so good and had heat for three weeks, Brian, before they... All got their, no, two weeks, I'm sorry, before they all got their heads flushed in the toilet and then beaten and tromped and et cetera. Here comes the pinnacle. They've shown up in a stretch limousine. They've got the suits on. They're dressed up. Not a FTR did a good promo, and Cash is stepping up. I liked his fucking promo. He had a little oomph to him. If any of this was either believable material or their angles and the way that this whole thing had been booked was any good, these promos would be very good heel promos. I mean, they're they're trying to be serious and talk about preposterous situations like they really mean something, and the booking has been so ass-backwards, they got nothing to crow about, but they, they can speak. Uh, even Spears, he tried hard here. Wardlow should be strong and silent. I don't believe him. But MJF closed strong. If this group had been booked in any way correctly, they would probably draw you some money. But since it's been such a clusterfuck and a joke and an amateurish presentation from the start, not because of the fault of the talent, but because of the fault of the loose nut behind the wheel running this company, it's just, it's more people saying things about stuff that you can't possibly ever believe that they mean and you don't believe the shit they've been doing. But it was a good promo. Interrupted, of course. God. <laughs> By Chris Jericho on the screen. You know what? If I was a heel going out for a promo in the building, I would demand they pull the plug on the video screen. Because that way I couldn't be interrupted. Jericho and the dinner circle are out in the parking lot. 
And of course, they beat up the limousine with baseball bats and axes and sledgehammers and whatever the fuck. And it took forever. And the heels just stood there with a shocked look on their face in the ring watching it. Yeah, they watched the whole time. And, and Jericho looked like he was about to have a heart attack swinging that bat. Yes, because <laughs> you can't do a lot of damage except for, it, believe me, I know. You can't do a ton of visible damage to a car with a baseball bat except for the windows. Once you've got the glass, you're hurting your elbows. I'm surprised you didn't have a fucking stroke. Uh, but the heels just stood there and watched them. And then Hager comes in, drive it. They, they can't even do that and leave it alone. And they spray paint the graffiti, Santana and Ortiz on the limo. They can't do that and leave it alone. And people might go, wow, that was, they've got to have the comedy. And now Hager comes in, driving a forklift and spears the forklift into the side of the limousine, picks it up off the ground, puts it back down, backs up and all the doors fall out of it. And and otherwise, the only thing they proved in this segment was everybody's allowed to say bitch and shit and flip the bird on fucking TNT now. And you know what? When Steve Austin was doing that and nobody else really had and was ever allowed to, and because of the way he looked and he was over, that was fucking cool. And they still got complaints at USA. But for these fucking children to be doing this after they do stunts in the parking lot with rented limos, I guess purchase limos now, hopefully they got, if they just rented it, they got the fucking insurance rider and just children doing it just to have potty mouth and flip the bird because they're allowed to. It's just more childishness. This is the most childish wrestling, child centered for either a child or a childish mind wrestling promotion I've ever seen in my life. When Steve Austin stuck up the middle finger, it stood for something. It was an act of defiance for the most defiant wrestler we had ever seen. Someone yep. who, as a heel, became a babyface because of that defiance. Right place, right time. When Jericho and the dinner circle give the middle finger, with Jericho having a big smile on his face, right into the camera, I see them as more fuck the audience we're yeah. gonna do this stupid shit and fuck you and i see it as grade school kids going oh look what we're getting to do on tv because they said we could tony said we get three shits a bitch and four fingers on this show and if everybody thinks i'm joking the tv network will be counting and i have seen i have seen memos from television networks indicating how many times that max you can say a certain word on a show according to their standards and practices anyway this sucked like <sighs> you said ftr it was the best promo we've seen from dax and aew so far i've enjoyed everything i've heard from cash on the mic he comes across as genuine but they never talk spears i don't care wardlow should never be on the mic I called it. As soon as MJF got on a mic, I said, someone's coming on that big screen. I knew it'd be yeah. Jericho. I didn't know what they'd be doing. And then this angle. And just, we say it before, everything Jericho touches turns to shit. This was some bullshit wannabe raw angle from 20 years ago. And it aired at around 11 p.m. on a Friday night, and no one cares. You could do all these things. I mean, it's time after time. They bloodied up the Young Buck's dad. They do thing after thing. And nothing registers. And then they just move on and go on to the next thing. And nothing actually matters. I forgot. Well, well, now I guess we don't have any more sympathy for the Young Bucks' father because they're heels now. Still. And the, and the people that, that raped him and sodomized him and brutalized him and nearly killed him are now the big baby faces. <laughs> it's only been six weeks. Yeah, a major angle that was done for a throwaway match. But they don't know what they're doing. And every segment where Chris Jericho ends up the same way. It devolves into his really poor take on what would have worked on Monday Night Raw 20 years ago. He is creatively bankrupt. I can't wait for Fozzie to go on tour if that means he will get away from this program for a while. He drags it down. And he's dragged MJF and FTR, who are favorites of mine, down to the point where I kind of don't want to see M MJF at all anymore. I'd love to see FTR have a tag He never match. wrestles. He never does anything. 
He never wrestles. Wade never, never does it. They don't even do run-ins. He does a heel promo, and then the babyface no embarrasses him. I mean, what he, the fuck? He comes out, talks good, and then somebody fucks his shit up. <clears throat> oh, God. But speaking of people who are being leaving or being told to leave, in the next segment, Darby Allen tells Sting to go piss off. So, let me get this straight. Last week, the the heels came out and said, well, you may have beat us on the pay-per-view, but if you get another partner besides Sting, I bet you can't beat us. So then this week, Darby, instead of saying, well, yes, I can, and picking another partner, he goes, you know what, Sting, you stay home next week, and I'm going to make this a handicap match. Where did we, where's the bridge of logic that we crossed from one side of that thing to the other? And I know they've said it's true. Darby is straight edge. He doesn't do drugs. Why does every promo that he does sound like he's cruising on Lake Havasoma? There's no passion. There's no emotion. There's no inflection. There's no energy. Some dull witted fucking guy. This is not a baby face. If he can't speak with any more emotion than that don't let him speak at all but he tells sting to stay home next week he's going to have a handicap match sting turns around and lectures him like he's his uncle sorry he's old enough to be his grand uncle darby continues to have no emotion in his the material and verbiage and this whole thing was rotten and they were talking over each other and then sting says okay i'm not coming and they fist bumped and he walks off. It was like two teenagers arguing about what movie to see. And nobody there called for a second take on this? Was there was there no time to do this over and maybe well? Is it that nobody that's in the department producing pre-tapes has the cachet in the wrestling industry to tell Stang, do it over again? It sucked. Because I've never had a problem with that with anybody. Do it over. It sucked. Here's why. This just... <laughs> this was two fucking baby faces with their faces painted, mumbling at each other about shit that didn't make sense to begin with. Why wouldn't Darby say, I don't need a partner, a different partner than Sting to beat you guys. I'll take you on one right after the other. I'll beat you both. But a handicap match, that makes a lot of fucking sense. And Sting stay home, even though every time I appear, they jump me from behind. All this is code for the Booker wants it to be this way, so this is what we've got to say and do. And ultimately, the thing that the Booker is doing doesn't make a lick of goddamn sense. Okay, your thoughts before we move on about Sting and his little delinquent nephew. This whole thing has been stupid the last few weeks. They kind of left it up in the air still. Remember, Sting and Darby were challenged by Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page last week to where Sting couldn't be his partner. And then they went back to them, and it looked like Darby had something to say, but then they just cut the break, and they left them hanging, and we never returned to it. And here we are returning to it. There was a novelty aspect to it originally, and there is some... There's some chemistry, something that works, bizarrely, between Darby and Sting. But at a certain point, this needs to go somewhere. You can't let either one of them speak. They will do damage no. to themselves whenever they speak. And I've been saying this for a long time about Sting, and everybody says, oh, you remember the promos he used to do. No, I don't. Nobody else does either. But at least he would howl and scream and go showtime and sound like he was alive and had energy. Now he looks like he's in a fucking iron lung. And Darby, god damn, I have more energy than Darby Allen does. I'm three times as old as he is. Just a monotonous, monotone, oh. Anyway, they did a package on Pizzeria Uno where not only was the delivery blah because he sounds like a fucking basement nerd which is what he is and what he looks like when he takes that mask off which is why they can't show his face um but now they're trying to leech sympathy off of Brody Lee's death by saying like this guy is going to win the TV title for Brody Lee you can't 
polish a turd. You can't even pick it up by the clean end. This guy looks and sounds and works like a fat fan playing masked wrestler. And it's gone on for nearly two years now. They've been on this, uh, doing this television program. Even their own fans hated the Dark Order from the start, but they wouldn't give up on it. And now that they completely resemble nothing related to any type of main event players or any type of gimmick that you could take seriously, and it's just a bunch of interchangeable, masked, sharpied-up job guys, they're still doing this. And there's no reason for it. Cut your fucking losses. You got suckered into signing the... Remember I said, whether he was Flip D. Burger or the Super Smash Brother or Pizzeria Uno, as he mentioned, he's been doing this 17 years. Well, after 17 years, shouldn't he have accidentally done something good by now? They ended up with him and his partner because a bunch of these outlaw goofs are the same people that were outlaw fans 10, 12 years ago that were constantly emailing us in Ring of Honor when we had Claudio Castagnoli and Chris Hero, Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin, Mark and Jay Briscoe, teams like that. There were, But you don't have the best team in wrestling, the Super Smash Brothers. These two fucking outlaw morons from Canada that used to do jobs on the HDNet program. I've said the first time I saw this fucking Uno in the locker room without his mask on, I thought it was one of the guys from the concession stand, and I was trying to, I was going to kick him out of the locker room because he had no business being there. Little did I know he was on the card. He still had no business being there. But <laughs> just admit you got suckered, give these guys a, a parting check, and hire proper talent. It wouldn't be that hard. But instead, here we have the TV title on the line with Miro, back to that again, against Pizzeria Uno. Because I wrote at the start of this, before they even rang the bell, if this is in any way competitive and goes longer than three minutes, it destroys every bit of the progress that they've made, making Miro look like a fucking monster instead of the Bulgarian Bluto joke that he was before. And that's what they did. Not only did they make this competitive, not only was it two segments and they went through a break, but it went long enough to expose both guys' fucking shortcomings. And we already knew those with Uno, but with Miro, they'd done such a good job the past several weeks. Now he's back to being Bluto. And did you see the best spot that I have ever seen in my life? When the fucking... Before they even went to the break, I couldn't believe there was a break in a match like this, but before they even went to the break, Miro is being strong and playing with him as he should have, and then they're out on the floor, and the pizza guy, Flip D. Burger, is standing kind of in front of the ring post, and the deal is that Miro's supposed to come with a punch, and the fat ass is supposed to move, and Miro's supposed to punch the ring post. But fat ass was three feet from the post, and he can't move very well. So when Miro came, he just had to kind of go, excuse me, right past fat ass, and he took a wide swing and punched the ring post that was three or four feet away from anything else that he should have been swinging at. It was so obvious. I had to rewind it three or four times. I was, what the fuck? He had to know. Even an idiot would know that what he just did looked like complete shit. And they just went on with it. They come back from the break. He's getting heat on fat ass. It's already gone way too long. Mira Bluto went to the floor and beat up the other dork order guy. And then he let this pudgy, fat, pale, unathletic, white fucking clown in a stupid outfit and an s and mask make a comeback on him fat ass's comeback in this instance should have been to the locker room 
after Miro destroyed him. <clears throat> but no, all the dork order, plus poor old Brody Lee Jr., come out to the stage and they put on a feel-good moment for a bunch of job guys and a grade school kid over the value of a main event wrestler on national television. And Uno was kicking the shit out of Bluto. So finally, Bluto stopped him and got his hold, and that was it. Miro was good, Bluto's back, and he's playing with children. And the just the, the visual of the... The Dark Order with the masks and the Sharpies on the chest and the cheap clothing and the kids, it's almost like some MTV special on spring break where they're eavesdropping on people dressed up as wrestlers acting, playing wrestling. I've never seen a more low-rent, cheap-looking fucking bunch of shenanigans on even local wrestling television than this. Did I miss anything? I don't think so. I'm not a fan of Evil Uno. I don't know anyone that is. If I could say anything, I agree with you. I've loved Miro the last few weeks. As soon as this match got competitive, I got mad. As soon as all the Dork Order were out there, I got mad. But if I could say one thing on the bright side, I don't know how many people are going to see this. This was in the second hour of AEW on Friday nights. We'll see how the ratings are when they come out, but... This is probably, of all the AEW spots to put a match in to have it buried so people don't see it, this may be the best place. They better hope there was a massive power outage on the West Coast and East Coast at the same time of historic proportions. They better hope for an... Uh, they better hope that <laughs> it was all just mass hypnosis that we actually saw this program and really TNT was off the air. That's what they ought to hope. Anyway, Tony Schiavone's back in the ring. I don't know if, if they pay him by the interview, he's he's great. If they pay him by the word, he's fucked. Um, he brings out Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang and his manager, Don 69 Me Callis. And did you see when Don Callis grabbed the microphone from Tony and Tony backed off like he was about to be mugged on the street? It's like, it's the fucking manager. He never treated me that way. He wanted to stay closer to me because he wanted to hear what I had to say. Anyway, Callus didn't speak nearly long enough before he gave the microphone to Harpo. I wonder, what is his phone sex name, you think? On the phone sex line. Because, you know, like you have the porn name, what, what was your pet's name when you were a kid in the streets you grew up on? That's your porn name or whatever. What do you think old Harpo Fingerfuck's phone sex name is when he's doing those phone lines? Desiree. Desiree McFingerbang? Or Desiree Twinkle Toes, or Desiree Olive Desiree Olivier. There is is Harpo's porn name and phone sex name, Desiree Olivier. Anyway, he proceeded to talk in a rather breathy fashion about Jungle Boys, and I quote, long flowing golden locks and underwear model esque body. But uh, then, you know, ran him down saying he has no guts. And then as soon as he says, and, he t and he's doing it like this. And, 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 oh, and Don. And as soon as he says Jungle Boy has no guts, Jungle Boy comes out chewing gum with a monotone expression, walking at a deliberate, slow pace, gets in the ring, do they do they anesthetize these baby faces before every television program? Is it is it against the law for any of them to show any fire, any piss and vinegar, any fucking emotion, any passion, any in indignation, anything except just walking around chewing gum like a bunch of flat-footed fucking zombies? So he comes out. And Harpo breathily whispers and exhale, ex, exhales his insults. And finally, Jungle Boy says, you talk too much. About like that. Well, of course, those are fighting words. So immediately, Twinkle Toes charges him. And they, they get into a thing and Olivier starts his heat. 
in the exaggerated comedy fashion with funny faces that he does. He's not like Ric Flair whipping off a fucking $2,000 suit to kick Ricky Steamboat's face in with his goddamn street shoes with a look of anger on his face. He does it in, a, in, in an awkward... He takes the jacket off in an exaggerated comedy fashion like I should, the manager, the goofy manager. And he makes the funny faces and he his it tries to get heat. But Jungle Boy comes out of that and then here comes the Cucamonga kids and Jungle Boy bails out. And it's it's children being funny. And there you have it. Your thoughts. Didn't care for this. We've talked about it recently. I'm not a fan of the Omega and Callus comedy stylings. They're not Bockwinkle and Heenan. They're <laughs> they're they're, they're B- Bullwinkle and Rocky is what they are. Somebody said on on the internet. Yeah, and they that, wish. That's the uh, yeah. They wish they had the residuals of Bullwinkle and Rocky. Maybe Natasha and Boris. But yeah, when Jungle Boy walks out there with a shirt on, just casually walking out. He looks he looks twelve and small in in plain black clothes with a casual walkout. I don't know why, and I'm not complaining, but no Luchasaurus, no Marco Stunt, without any explanation for the last few weeks, they just haven't been there the same way. Alex Abrahantes just disappeared after being there with his wrestler for a few weeks. Just things happen without any explanation on the show. I don't know. Well, well see. I, I, I understand that they, they, Marco Stunt, they finally caught him, put him back in the, you know, he, he escaped from a children's zoo. I did not know that. No. Yeah. They finally caught him. Um, your girl, Jane Cargill was there with her attorney, Mark Sterling. I'm glad that Stephen P knew is my attorney instead of Mark Sterling. Marketing revenues are up 43% across the board. And he put her catchphrase over. Here's the thing with Mark Sterling. He can actually cut a promo. He's well-spoken. The reason why this is not going to get over is because of his material and delivery. The material is phony because it's obviously meant to be comedic first and make a point second. And he, more importantly, doesn't say it like he believes it. Every heel that ever bragged and did it successfully, you could say whatever fucking ridiculous bullshit as long as you were saying it like you believed it. I see this guy performing, saying witty things that he's thought up to be clever and or somebody's thought up to be clever and or funny, and he don't believe it. Because nobody would believe it. Therefore, I don't believe it. Yeah, I don't care how stupid it is. If he believed it, I would at least give him credit for believing it, and I'd say, well, that's a fucking heel. He's an asshole. He really believes this shit. But it's just more people performing for us. Um, Lance Archer had a match. I wish a lot of matches could be like this. I don't know what the guy's name was. It was some tattooed meth head in jeans from a mobile home somewhere in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And he actually, they had a jump start here. He jump started Archer. He ran out of the ring, jump started Archer, and Archer b- tossed him right back in the goddamn ring. This guy was fishy white with tattoos everywhere, no physique whatsoever. Looked like he was wearing jeans and had wrestling boots that laced up the back instead of the front. I have never seen anything like this in my life, but Archer dropped him in, in about a minute and walked off disgusted and so did i i i paused the program at that point in time but at least it was quick you can't tell me that there's not a fucking qualified pro wrestler of a certain size and a certain little bit of experience that could come in and do a three-minute job for lance archer on national television and not embarrass the company just by looking so visually outlaw and low rent and cheap. They can't fuck it. a billionaire's money and they can't get one guy that looks like an athlete that has some level of experience to come in here and do a nice solid job for this guy. National TV. Anyway, I'm on a roll. I'm going to go to the next one. Nyla Rose versus Layla Hirsch. Your thoughts? 
Who cares? Okay, we're finished with that. And the main event of our evening. <laughs> I got several notes on this. I'll try to run through them quickly because this was a fucking mess. Powerhouse Hobbs and Brian Cage, Mr. Get My Shit In, according to everybody that said that's what that GMSI stands for on his tights, <clears throat> against Hangman Adam Page and 10 of the... We're not done with the Dark Order yet. You know all those executives, Brian, that have been getting fired over at the WWE lately? Yeah. Well, I got news for you. If Vince McMahon ever just saw one time, saw 10 walk out and get introduced on this TV show, he would fire every single person in his company that suggested that they give anybody on his roster a raise not to go to this company. I'm talking to the, when they offered Gallows and Anderson money and then reneged on it. I, after they saw what this program was going to look like, I'm talking anybody that ever said, we need to give so-and-so a raise or they're going to go to AEW. If Vince just saw this guy walk to the ring, he would fire every single one of those motherfuckers for costing him a fortune that he did not need to pay. And then he would have started from scratch and put in people that were not going to make stupid comments like that. This is... There's so many things on this show that look cheap and childish but there's no excuse for this. You're, they're doing this to themselves. There's no excuse for the Dark Order in more than one segment, let alone on the show. If you no, want them on but, the show, you can have that argument. They shouldn't be in multiple segments every show. And I mean, you, there's I don't, there's no argument to me to be made that any of them deserve to be on the show at all, but definitely not multiple segments, but the outfits that they're putting them in and the gimmicks, and it's not just confined to the Dark Order. They make things on this show look... They spend the money to destroy a limousine with a forklift, but yet these guys look like the dregs of any neighborhood outlaw group. So they'll spend money to recreate former Monday Night Raw sketches that Vince did successfully 25 years ago, but they will not go out and get proper talent. Tony Khan relied on the word of his executive vice presidents. Well, who should we have? And they recommended all of their friends should immediately be signed up for five times as much money as anybody else has ever paid him to do anything. And he don't even yet realize that he's been fucking sodomized up the poop chute, fucking fucked, dicked by the dingle dong of destiny. Back on YouTube now courtesy of the children that he hired to run this thing for him. Anyway, so this match. Brian Cage is a complete idiot. He's out there leapfrogging and trying to do technical mat wrestling when he looks like Lex Luger. He has to do all the stuff the kids do. And, and a lot of these marks, and I call the AEW fans marks, because if you'll suck down this treacle, you'll suck anything. <laughs> Um, they, well, it's amazing that a guy that looks like that can do that. Yeah, it is, which is why he shouldn't do it. Cause then it devalues it when a, they, that's the only thing these smaller guys got going for them. They're not big enough to compete so they can do flashy things. This guy's a goddamn bodybuilding beast. He ought to be stronger and more impervious to pain than most of these guys, but he's out there cartwheeling with them. And then once he tried to do that, then he shot Page off. Page ducked his clothesline. Page came off the other side with a punch, but Cage went to hit him with an elbow at the same time, and they both staggered like drunks. Then Page swung at Hobbs, but Hobbs ducked it because it startled him and he didn't know it was coming. Ten had blind tagged Page when he hit the ropes, and Ten came in and glommed Cage from behind while Paige just went out and sat down at ringside. Have you noticed that a lot of times when the babyface tags out, they won't go back to their corner? They'll take a bump out on the floor and they'll just go over and lean on the ramp and get their breath while their partner, whether he's pitching or catching in the ring, they don't bother to go back to the corner. 
I don't. They, they, then there was a sloppy heat spot on 10 by the heels. Will Hobbs has a great look. He's not only got great facials, he looks like a million dollars, and he's got a physical charisma that people want to watch him move around the ring. He's greener than a pepper tree, but if he was somewhere else, this guy, I would be almost convinced, is going to be a big star in the business. Having a partner like Cage, he's going to learn bad habits. If he learns anything at all, probably won't learn anything. How can you learn from a fucking turnip? Um, having matches like this, he's going to pick up bad habits. And I don't think, honestly, that there's a lot of people in the locker room like there would have been in Mid-South Wrestling 30 years ago that could have brought this guy along. But he should be a big star. But he's going to... He's going to learn bad habits. By the time the WWE gets a look at him, they're going to put him in various positions and situations and say, no, we can't retrain this guy. It's too late. Anyway, so Hobbs shoots 10 into the turnbuckle and charges, but 10 moves. 10 hits the far ropes, but Hobbs hasn't turned around, so 10 stops. <laughs> Then Hobbs turns around and then 10 starts running again and just runs right into Hobbs' knee and guts himself on Hobbs' knee. It looked like he committed suicide on Hobbs' knee. Just, I've stopped. I'm Oh, there he is. I'll just run right into it. And that was their break spot. I noted that I feel bad for Adam Page in this because he's as helpless as a heart surgeon being assisted by the lube team at Valvoline. And the patient is rapidly flatlining. Uh, Page made a comeback. The heels got real sloppy. And it went, Cage, I've given up on. Brian Cage. Hobbs, I really feel bad. But th all of this was way too complicated for Cage and Hobbs. Not only for their experience level, but also just they shouldn't have been doing this duck and dodge and run past and run around multi-phase high spot bullshit. Because they're two fucking power guys. And it just, it whoever called this for them to do it was insane. They couldn't do it. They couldn't remember it. They're not experienced enough. They're not smooth enough. It was a goddamn clusterfuck. It was a monkey fucking a football. It was goddamn offensive to most people. And the fans brought the, brought the tickets back that they bought for the last show. They were so offended. And then Brian Cage did a 619. Rey Mysterio six with this fucking five foot wide, jacked up steroid freak bodybuilder that gained 120 pounds or whatever after he left fucking high school. I he's a complete idiot and I like him less every time I see him. They're stumbling around in this complicated fucking finish four way like drunks on a dance floor, but somehow he thought if the bodybuilder does a six one nine that would save the match. Remember the things I've said, degree of difficulty of five, execution of 10? They had a degree of difficulty of 11 and an execution of two. And then Page covered Hobbs, but Hobbs had his arm under the rope. So now the referee in this match, Bryce Rimsburg, he wasn't going to count because the guy's arm was sticking out under the rope. Because also because that was the spot. He wasn't supposed to count. But yet you've just mentioned how referees disregard every other single rule of professional wrestling in every one of these matches regularly. But because it wasn't the spot, he didn't count and everything came to a halt. And then Paige walked over and fucking tagged dumb fuck back in. And they all started doing shit. And they lost the plot and the flow and then Starks threw the belt into Brian Cage. Cage looked at it and threw it back because, of course, they're doing this slow turn on each other. Starks slaps Cage. Cage chases Starks out of the building. They didn't fight off. They just walked off. And so that means that Hobbs is left with Tin and Page. So naturally, Hobbs should plant 10 with some big move but page should come out on top but instead 10 was still competitive with hobbs and then page hit the buckshot lariat and 10 covered him so 10 beat powerhouse will hobbs i give up 
this was not only so far past overbooked, but just a bloody scrambled egg mess. And 10 pins Will Hobbs. 10. 10. Not even two fives, but 10 beats Will Hobbs. Do you remember when... Oh, I don't know. Uh, fucking uh, to, to Vernon Deaton. Remember that time that he pinned Lex Luger right in the middle of the ring on TBS? Of course not. Of course you don't. So that was the main event of the evening. What did you think, Brian, before we... See, this is why we do this program last. Yeah, We no. have fun talking about everything else. No, this was... If we get here. This was one of the worst episodes of AEW Dynamite. Very little on this show was any good. I was falling asleep by the end of it. Because why stay I awake I for this? I could have done that. I, well, no, I got up and started watching it at fucking 8.30 on Saturday mornings. How do you think I felt? Do you think... I mean, this show, I thought, was bad even for AEW standards. I know there will be the usual marks out there, and I'm going to use that term in a disparaging manner. Yes. Who will say, oh, the Young Bucks had a great match, or, oh, Omega and Callus, what a promo. I thought this whole episode was a complete waste. But is that what AEW should be doing right now? If they know they're not going to have many viewers on Friday, should they just kind of no. be... No, I'm not saying they should have an awful show that we don't like, but... Should they be changing the pace now that they've seen the ratings for the first two Fridays? Well, of course, on a Friday night or any other night where you're out of your normal time slot. Unless you're going to be there for a few months and you're trying to, you know, establish that and get people over there. No, this two-hour Dynamite show, yes, Friday night at 10 may be their new show's permanent time, but we don't have a look at that show yet to see what it's like. So on Dynamite, we know what it's like so far. They ought to give us matches involving the guys they want to get over, the guys they want to get over, just not a jump start and an afterbirth and it actually try to go back and book wrestling the the real way where every match doesn't have a jump start or an afterbirth or a fuck finish or goes completely out of bounds of the rules and goes on that way forever and ever or is competitive regardless of the status of the people involved in it they ought to give us a solid fucking show where they give the guys that they want to push good wins. They give the guys that can talk some promo time to discuss their ongoing issues. Don't do any once in a lifetime angles or big fucking, you know, title changes or whatever while they're at a, on a different time slot, but at the same time, they can still use this show to further their business and get people over. But if they don't know how to do it on the show in its regular time slot, how do they know how to do it on Friday nights? They don't know how to get people over. They don't know how to have normal matches. They don't know how to treat this seriously and or book things that lead from one to the other logically it because you know, we're not all on Tony's Adderall and we don't get what's going on in the chemical makeup of his brain since we're not altered. So they could do a show without doing well, the goddamn greatest show of all time. For the record. And it would still be solid and for business. What now? Well, I was going to say for the record, I was slightly altered during the show. I still didn't like it. So that doesn't well, even but, solve that. But you're not altered in the same way because you're not, you're not as clueless about booking wrestling as tony khan is to begin with and then you're going the other way on your substances well thank you but anyway so so yes they could do a solid show on friday night while they they're with this time slot for dynamite and not give away everything they've got but still try to get people over but they would have to admit they haven't really been doing that so far to begin with it's a bunch of marks sitting as we've heard from from QT Marshall's own lips, it's a bunch of guys who are marked still for the business in Tony Khan and a few of these outlaw guys, and some guys that are certainly marks for themselves, Harpo and the Cucamonga kids, and they chime in a bunch of ideas, and it tickles them, and they say, how can we make this funnier? And will everybody giggle about this? 
and oh, our 500,000 fans that think that we actually know what we're doing will watch it. But the majority of America has long since given up on professional wrestling in general because of the unprofessional dipshits like us that are in it. So that's the way they do their television program. It's not going to change. It's just going to be harder to watch on Friday nights from 10 to midnight because you're having to stay up two hours later and they know that they're not going to get as many people watching so they don't even care as much. And there you have it. <sighs> well, if we close this thing up for the day, your final comments. Final comments. I want to congratulate AEW. They have made me miss Dynamite <laughs> on Wednesdays. They've made me miss Thunder on Thursdays. Oh, come on. With this fucking, oh. at, least, at least those guys <laughs> look like men. Come on. Anyway, uh, as we mentioned this week on the drive through, uh, we will. Oh, also, there's the uh, the last episode of Most Wanted Treasures is two hours on Andre the Giant. So we're, we're going to at least probably see some great video there. Uh, we're going to talk about that on the drive through Plus, we're going to have the exclusive announcement on my NFTs, how they can be gotten and where they can be gotten at and uh, how I can be gotten to, for all of you wondering. And we're going to have some questions and we're going to play some games and sing some songs and do all kinds of things on the drive through this week. Right, Brian? Right. Good. Well, in that case... Come back and see us then, because we're done for now. I've got to get some Listerine and wash the AEW out of my mouth. Folks, until the drive through and next week here on The Experience, thank you, fuck Dynamite, and bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>